Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Poker Showdown brought to you by Party Poker. I am your host, Jamie Staples, and we have a very exciting show this week. I actually just finished up a call with Patrick Leonard. He is our guest this week. We had a really long conversation talking about a ton of different stuff. Uh, Patrick, of course, a very successful tournament player, so we talk a little bit about what his journey's been from starting in poker to where he's at now. We talk, uh, you know, poker content. We talk a little bit of the Mike Postel situation. Uh, we talk a little bit about Twitch. We talk about Party Poker. So many things things, dude. Rob Young's story, craziness. So you definitely want to check out this conversation. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what else has been going on in the poker world this week. So let's kick off the show talking a little bit about some of the online poker results from this past Sunday. And we saw some pretty amazing results, a name that I haven't personally seen playing online poker in quite a while. Uh, one that I looked up to a ton when I first got into the game. I always thought he was such a boss, and he is still a boss to this day. That is Ola Shemian, who actually took down two PokerStars majors on a Sunday. Uh, so he started off playing the $1,000 buy-in Supersonic, uh, and he managed to top that field for $29,000. Ben CB, who is uh, a guy that I learn from in poker all the time, of Raise Your Edge fame, uh, the training site, he ended up getting second place, actually. So a uh, couple bosses of the game going heads up. And then Ola Shemian as well in the $1,000 warm-up, Managed to win that too for 30000 So won two 1K tournaments on Sunday. Pretty amazing result. Uh, congratulations to Ole Shemian. Um, also notables on Party Poker. The big game was back this week. So a $5,000 buy-in taking place this Sunday. Uh, it had 119 entrants. That, of course, was our Hero of the Week question. We'll get to that at the end of the show. Um, but I just wanted to shout out the winner, Sleeve Patrol, who took that down for $145,000. And to close, the $2,100 Gladiator, which runs on Sunday, uh, we saw a player, Jezoint, take it down for $84,000. So that's a brief wrap-up of the Sunday results. Congratulations, congratulations everyone. Uh, my day was like break even. I think a little bit down on the day. I had some chances. The new $320 Gladiator, which is 6 max now, slightly different than before when it was 8 max, had a bit of a run, but fell a little bit short. Hopefully, I'll make the leaderboards next week. So there's a lot of changes going on in Party Poker, and I wanted to touch on some of these because they're going to be interesting to a lot of you. Uh, so much has come out this week, mostly through Rob Young. Um, crazy Uncle Rob is how I think of him because like every time he tweets, just something is out of control crazy. The first thing, honestly, I was streaming. This blew my mind. $215, 1 million guarantee going down on Party Poker. Um, million dollars guaranteed on a Sunday. Pretty crazy. And it's not a knockout. It's just a freeze out tournament. It's a straight up vanilla, $215 buy in, 1 million guaranteed. This is taking place, as I have it open in my lobby right now. Um, November 3rd is the sort of day 1D. Now, how this is going to work, there's actually four flights to get in. You're not allowed to re enter the flights, it's one chance but you're gonna have an opportunity to play on Sunday, uh, the 27th of October for $215, on Tuesday, or on Thursday, or on Sunday. So there's four flights, no re-entries per flight, and the idea is actually to get this tournament to finish at 2 a.m. in the UK. So it's gonna finish much earlier, like sustainable tournament for people to play if they have work the next day, which I think is cool, but I mean, obviously an insane attempt by Party Poker because how are you gonna get this many players in a tournament? Uh, I don't know. like. I work with Party Poker, obviously. I'm excited about this tournament. I don't think it's going to hit the guarantee. So this is a value hunt for you guys. I'm just letting you know. This is going to be a crazy one. Uh, pretty excited to play this $215 buy-in. Um, early finish. And I hope it's successful. I hope people show up and support it because I love playing $1 million guaranteed tournaments for $215. Pretty fun. So that's the first thing. Second thing, the Hurricane Dorian Charity Tournament that we've covered uh, in the past. We have the results from that. $68,200 was raised on Sunday in that $100 buy-in. I was in for two bullets. Uh, of course, Party Poker put up around $70,000 in prizes, I believe, uh, for the, the Millions event that is taking place in the Bahamas. And all of that money is going to benefit charity, supporting sort of the Bahamas in their time of need going through, uh, you know, a terrible Hurricane Dorian. So... I think a really good initiative. Thanks to everyone that chose to play that event and uh, support a good cause. So that's the second thing. Next up, and this is really big news. So from October 27th on, we're not going to be doing satellites for tickets on Party Poker. Unless there's specific situations. But in general, um, instead of rewarding tickets, you're going to be awarded tournament dollars. Which means you can play any satellite. You're going to get tournament dollars and you can use that for to buy into any tournament. 
which is pretty amazing, right? Like, let's take an example. You play an $11 satellite that awards $109 tournament dollar, you know, prizes, okay? And you want to take a shot at a $1,000 tournament. Well, you need to win 10 satellites, and then you're going to have 1,000 tournament dollars, and then you can play the event, right? So you can really use satellites however you would like to get into the target events that you're interested in. And you're not going to have the expiry of like, oh, I want a ticket, but I have to use it in the next couple days or else it's going to go bad. Or I don't really want to play this 320. I want to play this 109. It's all going to be so much more flexible. That is starting up October 27th. This is a very good thing for players because... Obviously, we have ultimate flexibility in being able to choose which satellites we play. It's a little bit scary for the site, and Rob Young touched about this on Twitter, because they're not as easily able to project where the satellite seats are going to go, you know, so they don't have that guarantee. But they're taking a risk here, again, uh, in favor of players, so I think this is a great thing, good for everyone to know. And then the last thing, which is huge for me and sort of my career and my my Twitch stream, is the tournament schedule has been completely revamped. Uh, it's very, very different. And there's a couple general themes. So there is deep stack events and, and sort of like no limit hold'em freeze outs. And if you go in the lobby, the easiest way to kind of look through this is the color coding. Okay, so there's blue tournaments, which are regular events. Now there's the red tournaments, and a lot of these are bounty hunters. Those are, of course, progressive knockout events, you know, the most popular events on the site. So those are in red. But we have something called the Masters now, which is sort of a royal green, uh, and that is a deep stack freeze out. So those are 15 minute levels, I believe. Lots of, uh, you know, 50,000 start chips, but very slow structure, a lot of play. You have the Gladiators still, which are in now sort of a puke green. I'm sorry, I don't know who chose the green on that one. It's a puke green, that's the only way I can think of it, but it's still a great tournament nonetheless. They switched to six max um, and in knockout format. Patrick Leonard, in the interview that is going to come up after this, talks a little bit about sort of the thought process on those gladiators and the switch to six max. So, you know, th those are great tournaments and they have been great tournaments before, but that's kind of a mainstay of the previous schedule. And then a new color we see is uh, a purple, which is the Turbo Bounty Hunter. Um, so those are sort of dotted throughout the schedule, but the feedback has been amazing so far. The schedule's been out for around five or six days. Again, you can go to Rob Young's Twitter and sort of see, he breaks it down buy-in by buy-in and shows you like the new high rollers, what's new for $1 to $33, uh, etc. So you can really get in depth if you're interested. Um, and feedback has been resoundingly hyped up. Like people love it. I love it as well. I've played it, uh, three or four days, I think since it's come out and it's just, Amazing. There's so many things to play. Um, so I think you're going to like it. If you haven't checked out the new schedule, check it out. And if you have feedback, pass that along. You can post it in the comments to wherever this video is being uploaded, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or, you know, clip on Twitter, Instagram, wherever it is. Um, pass along your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but it's overwhelmingly been pretty good and prize pools are increasing. So very excited about that continuing into the future. On the live poker side of things, we have two stories to cover this week. First of all, World Series of Poker Europe is kicking off at the King's Casino in Razvodov in the Czech Republic. Uh, very excited about following this event. The very popular vlogs of Daniel Negreanu, uh, which I think are so great. Like, they're so encompassing, and they bring a lot of new people into the game. He's going to be vlogging this experience. Uh, I've already watched his travel vlog of traveling there in his first day. So uh, if you're interested in following that story, I would recommend check him out on YouTube, Daniel Negreanu. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's Dean Eggs Poker or Daniel Negreanu, but you'll find him. Just search him up. He's doing vlogs uh, daily and really excited to follow along with the progress uh, myself as well. The next thing, uh, there is a champion. John Gribben is the winner of the mini main event, right? Yes, the Reno mini main event. Uh, run it up Reno event I've been to four or five times. It has such a friendly atmosphere. It's like no other poker event I've gone to. I have really fond memories of that place. Uh, the mini main event has taken place and there is a champion, which is John Gribben, who took it down for $30,000. So I wanted to pass along a congratulations to him and best of luck, everyone at that event. Uh, we have Party Poker Team Online member Egyptian at that event. So hopefully you win the main event then. Uh, a bunch of the Thirst Lounge uh, is there as well and uh, old friends as well. So uh, great events and best of luck in the series. Next up, we have a live poker hand, and this is a pretty exciting one. I haven't seen it yet, but it's got Isildur, Victor Blom, and it's heads up, so it can't be bad. I mean, a legend of the game, so I haven't seen the hand yet. I'm going in readless. Let's check it out. 
Izzel with king six. He comes in for a raise. Pavel has queen seven suited in the big. Can't see him going anywhere. Okay, king six, your head's up here. You're going to be playing almost every hand. Pavel in the big blind with a very nice hand. He raises to 35 million. A hand you'd like to play, you know, of course, when there's only two people in the pot. Pretty much any suited hand in this situation. Not necessarily one you want to re-raise. Just call because it plays so well post-flop. Uh, but it is just queen high at this point. So we see a call from Pavel. Pavel calls. And we go to a flop. Nice door card, and both wow. players have flopped a pair. See, Isildur does a backdoor flush as well with his king. Very spicy flop here with a king, queen, nine. Isildur with the top pair uh, with the king, six. And then Pavel flopping second pair with the backdoor flush draw and the queen, seven. So both players like this pot. Isildur is going to want to bet. He has the top pair in a heads-up situation. It's a very draw-heavy board. You can get value from your opponent having a queen or a nine. You can protect against all those draws where you can charge them money and, and earn profit from them. So you want to bet if you're Isildur here. And then if we flip it over to Pavel, which we don't know what he's going to do yet, but to me, I mean, you would think he's going to continue in some facet. Pretty decent hand with the queen seven. So let's see how it plays out. He keeps the aggression up as he has done every time he's flopped any hand in the heads-up play. Pavel, of course, has backdoor diamonds. So Zildur bets 45 million into the pot. Okay, Pavel. He will. Surely cool. Now, if he catches a diamond on the turn, he might want to play the hand far more aggressively. Obviously, if a heart comes, Zildur will be in the same spot. Currently winning, and it is the ace of diamonds on wow. the turn. Well, I imagine... All right, so we see a call, a bet and a call from Isildur and Pavel, and we go to an ace of diamonds turns, which is a very crazy turn, right? Pavel, with the second pair on the flop, now his third pair. So another overcard to his hand, but he picks up a flush draw and the nut flush draw at that. So a hand that can be very strong and could potentially end the tournament if he hits it. So that's really big. Isildur with the king six, you know, he makes a bet on the flop, but he sees a card he really doesn't like. It's an overcard to his hand. Uh, it can complete some two pairs as well from his opponent, uh, although some of those hands are going to re-raise pre-flop, so it's not the best card for Isildur. That said, we are heads up here, so I wouldn't be shocked if he decided to go for another bet. I mean, we are talking about one of the very best players in the game, so he is capable of making some thin value bets in spots where maybe I would potentially be a little bit too scared and not be able to read that situation. So let's see what he does. Listen, Isildur checks back. Pavel. Unless Izzel thinks he can get his opponent to call with a worse hand. He is cutting out a big bet. This is Isildur, like the boss he is, goes for the bet on the turn with the king six. With third pair nut flush draw. Isildur put in a sizable bet there. 105,000. Currently winning with his king. Pavel obviously will call cool here. Does have a pair and the backdoor nut flush draw. reason for him to fold and if you're pavel here you really can't fold your hand you know you have a pair which might be good isildur can be bluffing here of course he has a reputation of being a very aggressive opponent so you could be good with your pair of queens but then you also have a draw to the nuts which could potentially end the tournament so it's a spot where you need to continue hopefully you hit a diamond or a queen or a seven uh raising I don't think is great. I mean, it's it's possible. You could try and get Isildur to fold a king that you think might be value betting kind of small on the turn. Um, but at the same time, we have a pretty decent hand here with the queen. So I'd be surprised to see a raise. But he's thinking about it. I haven't seen this yet. So let's see what happens. It wouldn't surprise me if he raised. Well, I think raising just makes all the bluffs fold. and everybody See, that's what I'm thinking. Oh, he doesn't, I don't think he's thinking Isildur is necessarily going to bet this big, which is mm. the king. If he There's the that, call. He, he would raise, but I think he's expecting Isola to check back. Let's see a river. Isn't the, wouldn't the ace have been a good card just to rep it, though? And, well, he's got a pair. If he had no pair, then I think he might try and bluff. But so the river is the five of hearts. Pavel bricks his two pairs, bricks his flush draws. Uh, it's a meaningless card. It doesn't complete... I guess it completes the backdoor heart flush draw. Uh, so that's something. I mean, it's technically possible for Isildur to have the hearts... Uh, or it's possible for Pavel to have hearts here as well. So I guess it's a somewhat consequential card now that I think about it, that they have hearts, um, but it doesn't improve Pavel. So what's the situation for him? I think I would check here. I think your hand 
is a little bit too good to want to jam. If you want to jam here as a bluff, you probably would have wanted to fold the turn, I think. But this is some high-level poker. This is heads up. I really don't know what to do with Pavel. See, I think I would check in-game, and I would fold to an Isildur bet. Uh, but I have a feeling that's not what's going to happen in this hand, in that they've sent me this to review. So let's see what happens. Let's have a losing hand. I suspect this will go check-check. Oh, we're trying to work out how you you see the one. commentator saying, I think it'll go check check. I'm desperate to get to showdown. So he could rep hearts here. He does rep hearts. Wow. He moves wow. all in. What a play. What a play. So Pavel moves all in here with the queen seven. He It's worth noting, he, he is bluffing his hand, right? He's trying to get Isildur to fold a hand like a king. He's trying to get Isildur to fold a hand like an a, a weak ace uh, he's representing hearts that got there now that's a pretty thin range right if we are pavel we're not gonna have a jack 10 and play it this way you know unless we have the jack 10 of hearts right uh we're not gonna have very many two pairs or or sets that choose to play this way because one of the conceivable backdoor draws got there and we would probably put in aggression before this spot on the river so to me alarm bells are going off a little bit that this line doesn't make sense but then let's also take a think about the other side of this, which is the flush completes, we're heads up for the trophy, and our opponent has just jammed all in for pot when the flush draw gets there. It's a very difficult spot for Isildur. And I mean, the fact that he has king six, like his hand is really bad. It's a bad hand. It's second pair on a very straighty, flushy board. But he might be able to piece together the story here and be like, wait a second, Pavel. Are you telling me you have a flush? Because that's really all you can have in this spot. I don't believe you can have a straight. I don't believe you can have two pairs. I don't believe you can have sets. And how many flushes do you have that are able to call the flop, call the turn, and now want to lead the river? It's a niche story. It's one of the greatest in the game. I think there's a reason I got this hand sent to me. I hope it comes. is a dark call here. He's, he's thinking it through in his head. He's thinking he called me on the flop. If he caught the ace on the turn, surely he would have bet. Well, it's, it's hearts or nothing. Raised. Yes, he's checking the chip count. Surely he can't call this. Just thinks there's no way Pavel check calls 100 million with a flush draw. In actual fact, he did. He had the nut flush draw in diamonds well, the, and a pair. Well, the problem, the problem is... The flush draw that he's most likely to check call with would be the king high flush draw for a pair of kings. And Isidore has that blocked. That is what is playing into Isidore's mind here. If he had the king of spades, he would he would just have to fold this. He does have the, pretty much the only flush draw. He is seriously call considering with. calling here, James. I, I, I can see why. I can see his reasoning. And he's right. There's, what hand does he call with a flush draw? Could, of course, be the nut flush draw. So as the commentators are alluding to here, uh, pretty interestingly, Isildur with the King of Hearts, he obviously blocks the pair in the flush draw. So on the flop, at these stack depths, Isildur is thinking like, if my opponent has a heart draw, he's just going to go for a check raise all in. He's going to put pressure on me. He's going to make me fold my weak hands. So it's kind of hard for Pavel to have a flush draw that wants to just call on the flop. But the sorts of flush draws that can call on the flop are pair and flush draws, because you have some showdown value, and then occasionally some ace high. Um, you know, flush draws as well. So Isildur having the king of heart makes it impossible for Pavel to have that pair and flush draw on the flop. So that plays into the decision here on the end. What's your feeling? I think he's going to call. On, 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 on edge here. I... <laughs> what do you think at home? I mean, like this is phenomenal. So close. Pavel, willing him to fold. This is for the title. He knows something about that. Want to call, so crazy. Telling him. Only the nut flush <sighs> places. Wow! Oh, what a oh goal! That's phenomenal! Oh my God! That is the greatest goal I've seen live. He reversed with Duff. You saw it. 
Isolde made the call of the tournament. Oh my word. Isolde with that call is look the at it, look at, Pokemon. Look, Pavel, Jeffy. dude. Oh, Pavel. It's so tough, Pavel. I mean, you can see it on his face. It's just, I mean, one of the best. One of the best to ever do it. Isolde, incredible call, heads up. I mean, I can tell you, I definitely wouldn't be able to figure that out on the fly. Like, there, there is a huge level of poker going on there. He put it together. Listen, I block having the pair in the flush draw. Uh, is my opponent going to get to the river with very many flushes that also want to jam? Something's not right, and he makes a call for the tournament win. Absolutely incredible. Can we get some more Isolder hands, please? Can we get some Isolder hands? Because I, I love the guy. Incredible hand. Wow. So that's it for some of the poker stories. We're going to hop into the interview now with Patrick Leonard. Patrick Leonard is a guy that, from when I started playing poker nine or ten years ago, he was a name that pretty consistently found himself in the circles that were being talked about. You know, like the small stakes grinders like me, when I was starting, looked up to guys like him that were really doing it and hitting new levels. And that's been pretty much consistent through the middle to the later half of my year. He's been a name that's been near the top. Uh, he's been prolific as well in terms of his stable. Uh, so he has a stable of poker players that play tournaments and he helps coach and sort of provide financial backing. And um, so he's, he's a fascinating guy in the poker industry. If you haven't checked out an interview or sort of uh, familiarized with yourself with him, or if you have, it's worth checking out. So. Enjoy this conversation with Patrick Leonard. And here we are with Patrick Leonard. Patrick, thank you very much for joining me uh, on this weekly Poker Showdown podcast. I appreciate it, man. Um, and yeah, excited to have a conversation because, you know, we're on the same team now, which, um, you know, has come about in the past six months or so. But I really don't know too much about your story. Like, we haven't had an opportunity to talk through your history. I just see you at the top of the Pocket Fives leaderboard, you know, and topping every tournament. So I'm looking forward to sort of learning uh, a little bit about how you got to the place you are and how you've managed to be so successful. So I wanted to kick off this conversation with um, asking you a little bit about your history. Like, how did you find the game of poker? What, how did you decide to get into the game of poker? And, and how did you get going? Sure, so when I was like... Um... I guess 14, 15, 16, I was like going out to like on the streets, drinking in like parks and stuff, you know, like getting up to like loads of trouble. Looking back now, it's like, it's pretty cringy. But when I got to like 16, 17, I kind of still wanted to do this, but my friends were kind of mature and at like a quicker rate than I was. And they were like, let's, um, let's play poker on a Friday and Saturday night. Uh, I was playing football, soccer, whoever's watching may, may know it is better, but I was, I was playing football usually on the weekends and uh, I couldn't really go. So I stopped, I used to just like sleep early so I could play football on the weekend. Then I stopped playing football so much and then wanted to see my friends again and spend more kind of social time in summer when like the football season finishes or whatever. And my friends um, were like, oh, well, we don't really want to go to the streets or whatever. We, we're, we're playing poker every Friday. So why don't you come around and play poker? Poker. and i would go around and i'd be like a huge fish but i'm like super competitive like losing in anything like chess poker football like whatever i'm like a really bad loser um i'm as a winner i'm quite chill but as a loser i'm terrible like if i'm playing on a football team against me if you're playing on a football team against me and you're beating me i'm going to be like the most horrible person on the pitch you know like <laughs> complaining to the referee complaining to to people on the sidelines trying to start arguments whatever just like i've always been a pretty bad loser in that regard and uh with poker i just got beat so every time they would be playing every day and i'd play once a week and i just i had no idea what i was doing i was losing and i was like fuck this like i can't allow this to happen like i need to get better so i started devoting time to getting better and playing and eventually i would be like winning in the home games like knowing just more than everyone else then i would go to like the casino with like the next guy in the home game who was good so like me and a couple of guys who were like at the top of the home game rankings which was uh, not high by any stretch of my imagination we would go to the casino and in the casino uh the same thing happened i went there and everyone was just more experienced than me i was i was just completely out of my depth and i went back home and i was like completely gutted that how could these guys just be so much better than me i, I thought i could just never be at a standard where i could beat these guys um so i started spending time more time more time and then eventually i would be like one of the better players in the casino again it's like pretty low stakes like 20 pound tournaments 30 pound tournaments so it wasn't anything big 
Um, at this point, my bankroll was probably like five hundred dollars maximum, right. maybe. You know, I'd be spending money, and I was a student. I was like stacking shelves or whatever. And um, I made a blog on a UK poker forum. It's called Blonde Poker. At the time, it was a really big forum, and uh, the 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 title of the blog was uh, "Best in the Business." Um, and I was like, I'm playing. 50 cents heads up singles right now my goal is to one day be ranked number one in one format of poker i don't know which it would be maybe cash games maybe plo maybe fixed limit at the time it was like 10 years ago right. whatever and everyone was kind of dismissive whatever but for the next kind of five six years every day i'd be working quite hard just to get like one step higher 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 and um eventually you know did did okay um but I, I kind of tracked my progress along at the same time i was doing journalism at uni mm -hmm. so like it was kind of a good thing to do alongside because i was like blogging every day and learning to write and like when you blog it's it's kind of like a psychological thing if no one replies to you you kind of don't want to do more of it but if people are replying to you then you'll do it like more absolutely more and more. Yeah. so as it from, from a journalist point of view i was kind of understanding the ways people liked to see you write, like seeing some emotion, the just right amount of swear words or foul language, but just not too much to send people off, you know? So I was kind of learning uh, the journalistic side as well by documenting it the whole way, which was quite good. Um, I was, I guess, 18, 19 at the time, and again, had no money, but I knew that I wanted to do journalism and poker kind of combined. So there's a guy um, called Rob Young who'd made a casino in Nottingham. Uh, <laughs> And he had this, um, I like wrote, I wrote to the casino. I was like, oh, can I come and like blog your poker tournaments? And uh, they said, sure, come down. So I did it for free. Maybe they paid my trains, right. whatever. And then all I wanted to do was like speak to this Rob Young guy. Cause he was like, you know, huge baller at the time. And I was like, I was like, wow, I need to like speak to yeah. this guy. So I was waiting and waiting and waiting, but he's always busy. He's always in meetings. He's, he's still a huge baller, by the way. Let's just set the record straight. He's still up there. Oh, you yeah. know? Like, he like you may have inflated, level, yeah. but to me, he's still up there in the sky. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I saw him outside in the car park and I went to speak to him and he kind of, he was busy. He was just like, oh, I'm busy or something. Sorry. And then I was like, fuck this guy. And uh, on this blonde poker forum, Rob was like a little bit active too. And he used to have his streams from his casino. And there was a commentator who at the time I thought was like clueless. And I was like 19, 20, had a huge ego at the time. And I was writing on the forum, like, who the fuck is this commentator? He has no clue what he's talking about. How doesn't he know about blockers? Blah, blah, blah. Like, just stupid, like, egotistical stuff. And Rob is, I learned from that day that Rob is, like, very kind of, um, very close to his friends. Like, he'll protect his friends and stick up for his friends. And he'll do a lot to, like, help the people around him. And, you know, he's so busy. He was running all these businesses or whatever. And he came onto the forum like, who the fuck are you? I've never seen you at an EPT or something like this. Like, he tried to put me back in my place. And then that sent me off. And I was like, who the fuck are you, Rob? Blah, blah, blah. Like, you're just a fish or whatever, you know? And then uh, Rob was like, uh, you're banned from my casino. So I spent the next, like, few years banned from Dustal Dawn or the next couple of years banned from Rob's casino. And then I moved to Spain and uh, Gibraltar and Hungary. I was, like, kind of living in Europe, playing right. online, chasing like, over elite and stuff. And then I got a call one day from Rob, who'd just done this partnership with Party Poker, and he was like, oh, um, I know you've been in Spain. I was working as, like, an, uh, a poker ecologist. I would work with the sites, kind of explaining to them um how they should manage their network so like looking after recreationals what pros are looking for like the right balance like stuff like zoom and rush poker at the time we were like coming up with ideas similar to that right. you know so like kind of with ways this was pre-black friday so there's loads of room and money and marketing budgets etc so we had like a nice team uh full of like young kind of poker players and uh we would we were doing this a lot so rob knew that i had this kind of background and he also knew that i had a stable and he knew that i was playing a lot and uh traveling a lot around the world so we had had just like a conversation about uh things party poker could do because at the time party poker were like they were garbage like they had nothing they had very bad policies yeah. they were charging for withdrawals there was just loads of bots it just had like a very bad image you know so it was like how can we make poker players like uh trust party poker again kind of thing and this was now like three years ago right. or so and um now obviously i've spoke to rob almost every day since then and we're on a lot better terms than say 2000 and uh 
14 or whatever. That's amazing. Uh, I've never heard of someone getting banned from a casino because they're talking shit about a commentator. That's got to be a world first. I think that's exclusive to you, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was um, that, that was interesting. But along this time, a lot of stuff has happened. Lots of highs, lots of lows. Um, yeah. That's that's crazy. So a- okay, so you you start you start playing with your friends in the home games. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting that the competition seemed to spur you on in a huge way. It was the same way with me and my brother uh, with Zynga Poker, a Facebook leaderboard amongst our friends. My little brother had more chips than me, and I don't know if I'd be a poker pro if he didn't run good on the Zynga streets because I had to beat him, man. You can't lose to your brother like that. So I think that's really interesting. Um, so what was the progression from, you know, sort of becoming the best player in your uh, casino to tr- trying to become one of the best players at each game? What was that progression um, like? Because you just hit, you know, number one on Pocket Fives just recently uh, in the worldwide rankings. So, um, yeah, a lot. Of, it was it was a lot of luck to be honest. Uh, I moved. I was working in uh, Spain uh, doing this whole poker ecology stuff, and at the time I'd play like Sunday tournaments, and I was making maybe you know fifty hundred k a year. I was playing like once a week, which was you know pretty good. And then poker became illegal in Spain. Like it was all. For like one year, it was just completely banned. They didn't even have like stars.es. It was just like completely shut down. So I had to decide like, should I continue with my career and try to move up in the gaming industry? Or should I try to, you know, follow the pursuit of being a poker player? At the time, I was helping out in lots of different areas of the company. It was pokerstrategy.com. We were like the second biggest site in the world after uh, PokerStars. We had like 10 million members, loads of stuff going on. But because I think usually in the poker industry, like 95% of people who work in there, they don't really understand poker. Mm. So when you go into these companies, um, usually there'll be like maybe five guys who really understand poker. Usually they're like ex pros who like aren't good enough to be professionals anymore, but still like really understand the industry and have a lot of history in it. They kind of get like almost leached onto by every department. So like the VIP team ask them, can they help them on this? The education team ask, can we help you on that? All that kind of stuff. So. I was seeing all these different parts of the business, but the main business I saw was the VIP team. So the VIP team was run by my like really close friends and all of these VIPs had like the most terrible mindsets. They're always complaining. They used to lose their money gambling on slots, whatever else. And I was like, surely I can do it as good as these guys. Like I can put the time in, you know, I I love it as just as much as they do. And I have a decent mental game, which I realized at the time was like very critical. So I was just like, fuck it, let's leave Spain and just try to go and be uh, a supernova elite. Because for me at the time, there was VIPs and those professionals, but the supernova elites, they were like the true bosses. Like these were the guys who could do it every single day, day in and Mm -hmm. day out. And if I could get to that level, then I would I would see it like I've made it kind of thing. Um, so I went, I moved to Budapest and uh, I guess I moved in like September or something. And I started grinding cash games. I knew I couldn't get Supernova Elite. So I was just like preparing for the next year. I have no idea what, what year it was, maybe 2013 or 14. And I was like, okay, next year is going to be the big year. It's Supernova Elite. I need to learn how to eight table zoom. I need to learn how to keep my mindset in check. I need to learn how to study all this kind of stuff. So. I spent six months like heavily getting ready for the next year and then the next year started and every day i would grind like six hours of eight tables of zoom very consistent just hit my target of points stop my session and then move on kind of thing to the next day i was treating just like a job like a nine to five job and then i went to rob young's casino in england they had like a, a a uk tournament like championship or something and I, I think I came like 12 or something, maybe 15, like relatively deep, but like it wasn't big money. It was like maybe 2000 pounds mm-hmm. or something. And I was really tilted like, oh wow, I've given up like five days of Supernova Elite. How can I be so stupid? I shouldn't chase these fucking MTTs. It's crazy. Like they're just such a stupid <laughs> format. Right. Of I woke up the next day and my roommate in the hotel, he was grinding tournaments and he was like, let's order some dominoes, not even shower and let's just start grinding. And I was like, that sounds like a terrible idea. And then like five minutes, I was like with my bathrobe on, like grinding these <laughs> tournaments. Uh, that day, I, I I was terrible at tournaments. Like I didn't really know, I was I was a cash game player, you know? And I ended up winning three tournaments. And at the time, the Sunday warm-up paid out like 100K yeah. at first. I won, I won that, I won like two other majors, like I don't know, the big 55 and like something on Dotty S for like, I don't know, for like 160K. And I was like, still these tournaments are a joke. Like I'm definitely not going to play these anymore. So I went back to Budapest and then the next week I played another Sunday series session because, you know, 
I was kind of like I had kind of had the flashbacks of the right. week before, and I think I won. I think I won another two tournaments. I was getting so lucky at the time, like I should have just been playing the cash games, you know. So I win like another sixty k, which is like completely undeserved. And then I'm like, okay, still I'm not going to play this tournament. Uh, wait a no second, how? Wait one moment, man. How did you go from winning one sixty one weekend, three tournaments? You win two more tournaments, and the next week you're still like, no, 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 I'm still not going to do this. What is going through your head, just, dude? That's insane. Because in my mind, I saw in this VIP team that all of these guys were. Um, were like the degenerates were the mtt guys who i didn't want to be and the cash game guys were the smart guys and that's who i wanted to right be, you know it's so like in my mind i'd prepared six months for this as well like i'd moved to a new country and i'd prepared every day to get into this zone to get to supernova relief so it's like i can't give this up now um, but then the week after was the sunday million anniversary it gets like you know hundred thousand yeah, players yeah. or something and i got eighth or ninth for like another 100k and I was like, still saying, I'm not going to play these tournaments. <laughs> but then I was just getting luckier and luckier and luckier. Like I, at the time, uh, if you were good at cash games, it was quite easy to win at tournaments because the standard of tournaments, it was pretty soft. You know, there wasn't courses out there. I don't even think Run It Once was out yeah. at this point. So it was like, it was, you were feeling like it was, it was a little bit like taking candy from a baby. Like in a way where I was still probably playing terrible, like fundamentally in short stack, I was probably doing awful mm. stuff, you know, gambling too much or too little. But at the time it, it felt like you couldn't lose in these tournaments. Um, then my friend was, my friend was like, oh yeah, you're just getting lucky or something. And he, he'd been running bad and I, he was saying, you're just getting lucky. But I was convinced that, oh, I'd like crack these right. tournaments. And I was like, I was like, nah, like these guys in the top 10 on pocket fives, like they're not that good. And he was like, they're way better than you. And they were way better than me at the time. My ego was telling me that I was way better than them. So I was like, okay, give me six months. We make a prop bet. I'll be number one on pocket fives in these six months. And he was like, okay, sure. Booked. So we make like a small bet. It wasn't big money. It was just like pride and ego and like my opinion against his opinion. I wanted to be correct. I wanted him to be wrong. And then I just completely give up supernova elite grinded tournaments every day. And then within like, I don't know, two, three, four months, I was number one in pocket fives. And then I haven't played cash games since, since that day, basically. <laughs> so, so yeah, that that's was, amazing, um, man. How, how I got into tournaments, but it's all luck, you know, like obviously I was probably playing decently mm. or whatever, but it was all luck. Like I could have just bricked the first Sunday, never played again, bricked the second Sunday, never played again, bricked the third Sunday, never played yeah. again. You know, I just didn't have a downswing throughout the first four months. And if I understood MTT variants, I wouldn't have followed. I wouldn't have played tournaments for sure, you know. So I was just like so lucky. And that is poker. Like, there's so much luck in poker. It's not like winning one hand or something else. It's about just there's so much small things of luck, you know, that just absolutely, yeah. Together. I, you know, I think uh, an alter alternative sort of take on that is, you know, if it wasn't this, I think it would be something else for you, though. Uh, to be honest, like this went well, but if this didn't go well, there would have been something else that would have worked out. I think, you know, I. Uh, it it seems to be right place, right time with a lot of things, but it it's funny when I tend to interview people that are really successful, I think uh, they always find something that works for them. So I think those just exist, you know? I think if, if you wouldn't have done it in, in tournaments, maybe you would have become, you know, number one cash game player online or something like that. Who knows? Well, my biggest skill always in poker has always been networking. So like I've always been able to reach out to the people who are better than me and get them to teach me or to get or to speak poker with me every day. So like when I was working in poker strategy, not even playing cash games, I made a group on Skype, which was like six max crushers group. And it was like five guys who were all playing like five, 10, 10, 20, which was like high stakes at the time. And they were all like really good. And I'd, I'd made the group and I was getting like free content every day. Then I would find like a couple of guys to become really close to who were better than me. Then when it came to tournaments, after I'd been doing well, I realized that the best two players in the world were European and Elmerix. And I just reached out to them like, hey guys, like, do you want to start a stable, like a poker stable, mm -hmm. you know? And they were like, yeah, sure. Like whatever, they were young and they had probably too much money, I guess they had. <laughs> and they were like, sure, let, let's do it. And uh, at the time, like I was, they were playing against me. They must have realized I was like playing terribly compared to them. I actually remember very clearly, uh, we started talking because I'd played a hand against European on .fr. I'd like called it all in with a hand, which I should have done like ace 10 suited or something. And he was like, he messaged me the next day or something. He's like, dude, like you, you can't call these spots. You're losing too much money if you call like ace 10 or whatever. And I was like, oh yeah, I had a, I had a read on you or something. But I didn't have a read. I should like, 
huge pride. I didn't want him to realize I'd done something terrible, right. you know? I really didn't want him to think I was bad or whatever. So I just made up a lie saying, oh, yeah, I had a read that you did this or you did that this time. And he was like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then we started talking more and more and more. And then we realized he had a very similar approach to me, very exploitative approach. We were doing a few different things. Like we used to call a lot of free bets. People used to think we were fishy because people would free bet really small. So we'd open to like uh, two big blinds and they would make it like 4.2. Right. And we would call like king queen yeah. offsuit. And people were like, wow, how can you call king queen? You know, and we were like, we'd be calling like king eight, you know, like we'd call anything. Is this like price. 2014 so we, style, like where, where people are four bet, yeah. five bet clicking? It was all about free bet oh, five. Dude, this is the best. It's the best genre of poker we've ever been through. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we, so we said basically like we we think we know a formula to win. So let's start a stable. Let's start like with two or three guys and um, let's see if we give them a few coaching sessions and see how they do. So we started with a couple of guys and they ran really well. And again, again, it's luck. Like if these two guys had just ran poorly, we would have just sacked it off straight away. Fuck our lives. We've lost 30K in makeup, whatever. Like there's no way we can do this. Let's just concentrate on playing. But they ran well, I guess, or whatever. And then uh, it went on and on and on. And then uh, it got bigger and bigger, basically. And uh, through that, not only would the stable not exist, but maybe me and Sam wouldn't be such good friends as well because we'd go off in different directions or something. Mm. So I'm fortunate for it to be successful, not just because we've uh, had a good business here, but because I've managed to get like one of a guy who'd be like one of my best friends for the rest of my life, right. you know, through someone, through somebody else running good. It's kind of what I mean. Like small things can happen, which can like change your life forever. Mm. You know, it's like one guy winning like a flip in the big 55 where we have like, ten dollars each invested could then result in us being like uh friends forever yeah. you know which is a pretty crazy, crazy way for it to all work out yeah it is crazy i want i want to get into the stale a little bit before i do that i just wanted to point something out to the audience in general there's two people now that have told me networking and poker specifically has been really important it's you uh and then also um fader holtz told me if i was to start poker now the most important thing is talking to the people that know you have to you have to talk mm -hmm. to the best to learn the best strategies. Uh, I, I, would, I would say yes, but I would say also I think people talk to too many people as well. So like, there's a lot of content out there right now. For mm -hmm. example, like Upswing Poker, like Doug Polk, they have a very kind of theoretical kind of approach, like minimum de minimum defense frequencies, yeah. etc. Then Ben C D has a very kind of exploitative approach, like population is doing X, so we should do Y, and then uh fido and matthias they have a very kind of analytical kind of theory based yeah. style and then you know nick petrangelo may have a different style etc so when you start listening to like loads of different kinds of people or trying to talk to too many different people you can get lost you can get lost in the middle of everything you know like you're trying to implement four different world-class strategies which are completely different and then you get yourself completely lost and it's kind of the same thing if you if you speak a lot with an online poker player and the guy who plays in your local casino yeah. they'll have a different approach because both approaches can be good but they're both probably very different and if you try to implement both of them or listen to both of them in different ways then i think it can have like a very detrimental effect i think i've been very lucky that the people i've spoken to have always somehow thought the same about poker if i'd somehow spoken to two different people by accident in some way i could have been completely lost and just like punted off all my money or something as well you know so i think it's important to kind of uh target the people you, you yeah. speak to or you approach something like kind of understand exactly who they are and how they play and even just do like maybe one session together and then not be afraid to say look i don't think this will work out kind of thing you know yeah it's like and that like and commit to that one style of thinking i think makes sense you know as opposed to just like taking little pieces and just like trying to implement it all so commit to one try it out you know two sides that stand out to me is like charlie carroll and doug polk because they're always fighting and bickering mm -hmm. uh which is fun to watch yeah, so exactly. yeah like you know try it out but but uh both can be right i i'm with you 100 percent um so yeah so let's talk about this stable so for people that are sort of unfamiliar I'll, I'll do like a general summary because you know i didn't know anything about stables and poker until i got into it you know and i became a professional and then i was like wow there's this whole sub industry of people that play for a living so uh correct me if i'm wrong in this but essentially it's a group of investors generally professional poker players that will you know put a poker player in a tournament um so they'll take their action and they'll They'll take the financial risk and they'll share in the profits 
um, but then they'll take on the financial risk if they they lose over time. Uh, so it's kind of like a team, mm -hmm. not that you're sort of sharing whole cards or like doing anything like that, but you're working together to improve your game at the same time and operating off the same capital. Am I sort of right on that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's all sorts of different methods and styles, um, different ways that it's, it's it works out with the makeup or with the finance, etc. Uh, I think lifetime, there's probably been maybe 500 to 1000 stables, maybe more, you know, like the stable, but there's probably been at least a 1000 people who have staked more than two people, which is like a mini stable, yeah. all the way Me to too. staking like thousands yeah, of people. I'm one of those. <laughs> and, I, and I and I think from those, I think there's maybe like two or three which have stood like the test of time, which has like been successful for more than five years or still around after more than five years. Um, and out of those two or three, like, got I'm not sure like how profitable like everyone yeah. is, you know. So I think in general, it's one of the biggest myths in poker. It's like, oh wow, poker players win money. Like ROI is so big, give money, and this is this is the way to get rich. Like. I would, I would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend to never get involved in in staking. It's like, it's it's almost impossible. I would say it's like the, it must be one of the toughest things, in in poker to to do. Like, there's just so much. Like, first of all, you have to get a player, so you have to attract yeah. the player. So he has to come to you instead of someone else. So you need to have very, very good coaches to for him to join you rather than a different stable or you need to have a usp and there's not many usps in stables either you give a, a large equity share which is usually very bad for the business and it doesn't become profitable or you hire very good coaches very good poker players generally don't want to be coaches because they're too busy playing yes. poker because they're good mm -hmm. poker players or you pay them a huge or you have to pay them a huge amount of money um you have to pay them a huge amount of money uh, and then it's not profitable to have them as well. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult to attract the poker player. It's usually not plus EV to attract the poker player. Once you keep him, you then once you sorry once you attract him, you then have to keep him. So let's say you let's say you coach him a uh, hundred times. Your first session is going to be by far the most beneficial to him because you give away kind of your ideologies. And then the next second, say ten sessions, will be very, very influential because you'll be like slowly uh, giving him your like imprint of how you view poker, and he can he can like play, uh, make mistakes, come back, ask questions, and then, but then after say twenty sessions or thirty sessions, you know he's not going to get as much out of the yeah. Basically. So to keep a player is very difficult as well. And then the third thing is to monitor a player. So let's say I let's say I'm staking you and your ROI is twenty percent at fifty dollar ABI. How do I then know when you go from twenty percent player to a ten percent player? Mm. Because variance in poker is so big. Let's say you go on a huge heater. Do I then move you up stakes? Like how do I know to move you up stakes? You know, like how can I analyze your game? to make sure that you're a 20% player, 10% player, 15% player, 5% player. It's virtually impossible. The only way to do it is to go over hand right. histories. But if I go over one hand history, maybe you're playing your A game, maybe you're playing your B game, maybe you're playing your C game. So I have to go over basically 100 hand histories that you've played in the last two yeah. months to get a good sample size, to see how you play in all different formats, because maybe you're good at PSGOs, but maybe you're not good at vanilla tournaments. You know, like there's so much to do. So. I have to go over a hundred hand history. So let's say I go over a hundred hand history. For, I don't have time to have a stable of 10 people because I can't go over a thousand hand histories, right? So it's virtually impossible to track and monitor players. And let's say that I do go over a hundred hand histories from you and you make $5,000. So I get 2,500 back. That means I've spent a hundred hand histories to make $2,500 and each hand history probably takes at least an hour. You know? So it's, yeah. To get, and also to be able to analyze it at a level at such, such a high level you have to be like an absolute world-class player so for the player to want to have a stable and spend all the time doing 100 hours his hourly is then going to be like five dollars or ten dollars yeah. so it's not profitable for a world-class player to have a stable it's, a, it's a very tough enough. business there's so many problems with it i mean it's it's essentially managing poker players you know uh and i i don't know how you get there around the economics like unless you do it at scale unless you're coaching 100 people at once uh it's it's got to be tough to figure that out so i mean you're right i can only think of three stables that uh you know i remember from sort of when i got into poker you know i i think of bbz i think yeah. of yours bit b and i think of pokar uh you know and i don't know how how successful any of those are doing you know those are just like three i can think of but I remember when I first got into poker, like 
anyone was getting staked. If you had a Twitter mm -hmm. handle or if, sure. if you talked on Skype, good enough, hop in there. Yeah, you know, and I think sure. it's easy when there's so much money in the poker economy that games are simple. You know, back when, when I started playing and sort of similar, I think, to when you started playing MTTs, you just load up as many tables as you can and just like raise every button and cut off and you're just mm -hmm. printing money. Like you're losing money by not registering tournaments. And that was kind of the whole thing. Um, it's for a sure. different game for now sure. in a 2019 poker world where we're actually having to be good to earn money at poker. So, absolutely. So, like, what? Absolutely. I mean, out of the out of the free big stables, like, I, I would be the first to admit, like, I struggle. Like, we probably make like 10 to 20 percent of what we used to make, or like 20 to 30 percent. Like, the profit we make compared to one year ago, to five years ago, it's like it's minuscule. You know, it's like barely barely worth doing it. You know, a lot of the reason why I do it is because of the community and because of what I can get out of it too. Like we've we kind of developed the community of very hard-working players and very nice guys so like on tomorrow we're all going to budapest for like a holiday together like no poker like just like a friend's holiday all from the stable you know so like i do a lot of it i do a lot of it not necessarily for the for the finance point of view but just out of what i can get out of it as well from like a personal point of view or maybe they can help me get better in certain ways or question my thoughts or whatever right. So like we definitely struggle financially compared to how we used to be. It's definitely not like a printing machine or anything like that. If you look at BBZ, I think now he does like uh, he's twitching and like selling coaching rather than like if I let's say I started like selling coaching, like my guys would be like, okay, well we're just gonna leave, play for ourselves, and then like watch your coaching for a hundred dollars or five hundred dollars, yeah. right? Because they give away, they all make like they should make like fifty to hundred k or whatever, so they can just like buy the coaching and keep all that EV yeah, kind yeah. of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So like doing more of the coaching thing and poker not too sure like i don't i don't really see too much mm. what they do and i think they have like a lot of like low stakes brazilian horses and they have a few good guys who maybe play a little bit higher but i don't think any of the stables are doing particularly well and like uh, bit b bit b for sure and the other two i'd imagine you know like aren't doing as well as they were doing two three four five years ago and if the trend keeps going i would imagine there's going to be no stables in like a few years for sure right. you know and i just it's often very it's often very annoying because people would be like, oh, there's such a huge drain on the poker ecology economy. Like they take all the money out, but it's not true at all. Like if you take a tournament like the big one on nine, um, the big one on nine used to get like 500 runners, 600 runners. And it was like 50K, 60K guaranteed. Everyone from poker would play. Everyone from Bitby would play. Everyone from BBZ would play. We all then start seeing sample sizes where because the structure of the tournament was quite poor, we, we all start realizing like we're not winning enough money in a tournament for it to be sustainable for our guys to play so we all basically took our horses out of these tournaments and then overnight it went from 50k guaranteed to like 15k guaranteed mm -hmm. you know so like without stable stables are like the big the best vip team for for a company because one they're they're throwing literally millions of dollars a month at players into these tournaments these are players they don't 100% know if they're if they're profitable playing you know these are players that they drop in hundreds of thousands of dollars of makeup you know it's so like let's say i drop a player in and two hundred thousand dollars of makeup that's two hundred thousand dollars i basically donated to the prize pools of the sites to help grow the guarantees you mm -hmm. know because like it's come out after a few months that i shouldn't have been staking this guy into these tournaments that was basically staking a losing player which you know that's like the best vip acquisition tool from any site you know like stables are so important for uh for poker side success i think and people always think i'm very biased about this because i own a stable obviously and because i'm connected right. to party but without stables i think like even the big 55 for example it gets like 300 runners mm -hmm. now you know like i imagine half the players who played are staked let's just say that the stables didn't exist anymore people would maybe play 22 dollar tournaments for themselves instead of being staked to play 55 yeah. tournaments mm -hmm. you know like with that, it's very difficult you know like the sunday warm up all of these kind of tournaments on all the sites party poker as well you know like Without the stables, I think that I think the, I think MTTs would be basically dead. You know. So Sorry, I, I have a different take on this. I don't think you're biased, and I don't think you're lying. I I 100% believe what you're saying. I think. I don't necessarily think it is a good thing, but I agree with you in that it helps with liquidity. I I think all of these bigger tournaments would suffer big time, um, you know, if stables weren't playing them. You know, the the 55s and the 109s, um. But I, I do see the other side as well of like these tournaments get tougher because there's close to break even or slightly winning players, you know. So I think that makes a tournament like, you know, the 
the 320 gladiator or you know so the old 55 gladiator i think that makes it more difficult because staking exists and these players would be playing on their own in eleven dollars and twenty two dollars but you know because they're backed they have the financial backing to to play higher stakes um so i think it it benefits sites in the short term i think greatly because it increases rake and it increases those prize pools and the guarantees and the headlines but in the long term i feel as if the economy may may balance without sort of this financial backing um well if you take an amateur player amateurs generally want to play high guarantees you know like people are attracted by high mm -hmm. guarantees right so if you have um like let's say 100 players who are break even in a tournament like um you know a 55 dollar tournament with a 400 player guarantee if you add another 100 players this and make it a 500 player guarantee these players are going to be break even or like if you add in these break-even players so that you get, you get a lot of amateurs who play because of the break-even players you know because the break-even players are driving their price mm -hmm. pull up so that people can play high guarantee tournament yeah. you know like a lot of amateurs like i know ryan reese wrote to me on uh skype one time he's like i only play a million dollar guarantee tournament today, <laughs> i think he said so like he wants, he wants to play a sunday million yeah, yeah. you know so like once there's a sunday million around he will play and obviously he's a winning player but there'll be a lot of players who are attracted by these like let's take this sunday million which is going to the party million which is going to come up on party in uh, yeah. a few weeks like you need a lot of break-even players to play that tournament to get to the million dollar yes. guarantee then once you get to the million dollar guarantee you then attract th hundreds or potentially thousands of people who are attracted by this huge guarantee of a million dollars you know it, it, it's like a marketing thing to go around also in it let's take a tournament like a 55 dollar or like a free 20 gladiator is a perfect one for it there's a lot of people who are staked for this tournament who are minus EV in the tournament, who would never play the tournament on right. their own money, and their backers are, they don't know how to rate their skill, or they don't know how to, like, there's a, there's a perfect example. There's, there's a player who was playing for a different stable, and he was playing, um, he was playing very high stakes. He was playing for a rival stable, and I was playing against him every day, and he was really bad. And he was a huge loser and people would play the tournament when he played it because he would play and he'd be like, okay, let's table select, let's sit on his left. You know, he's very bad. He's very spewy, whatever else. And he was losing, like, I must, he must have been losing like 20, 30%. Like he was playing very bad. And I thought at one point it was just getting too much. So I wrote to his backer, who's a rival, who him losing money is good for me, essentially. And I was like, look, this guy you're staking into these tournaments, he's a loser for sure. Like, just go over a few of his hand issues and you'll see he's punting it off. He doesn't care about the money. He's blasting. He should play like way lower. And he went over the hand issues and wrote me back a few weeks later. He's like, yeah, he's like dropping down to like $55 tournaments, sort of, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, there's a lot of players who are playing these tournaments who are staked, who are losing. Like, I've, I personally have staked hundreds, if not thousands, of players who have been losers in tournaments that they've played yeah. like maybe they're plus EV in 50% of the tournaments but maybe 50% they're not plus EV in you know like I think almost every single player that I've played that I've staked that I that I still stake at one point I've moved them down in stakes maybe they've came back up later but almost every single person has moved down at stakes at some point meaning that they've been minus EV in some tournaments that they shouldn't have been right. in you know so that's like over like a thousand players like once you start seeing them playing like 6,000 games a year, you start getting like hundreds of thousands of games between these stables of minus EV players in fields or break even players in fields, right. you know, which drives the guarantees up, which then attracts recreational players to to play on um, X site instead of a Y, yeah. y site, you know? Yeah, I, I understand that argument and, and I hear it. I just, like I have a bit of context in that, you know, I've worked with, with Stars and now I'm with Party Poker, obviously, and like a lot of the data that's come out really makes a lot of sense to me, which is like beginning players, first time depositors, newer players, the rate at which they're losing their deposit is so much faster. And I think that is, to me, the biggest argument sort of against this model of that. If it's going to be 10% lower ROI in these tournaments, because there's a bunch more break even players, which of course winning against a recreational player, um, if they lose 10% faster, that makes a big difference over the long course of a site. Um, so that's kind of like my concern with it, but you have a lot more data at your disposal. So uh, I feel like we could go round and round in circles all day and, and you know, um, it's really tough to say, but that's that's at least an alternative take on, on the situation, so. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I, I don't want to like compare XMTT and YMTT because it gets very it gets very dangerous when it mm -hmm. goes like that, but there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of comparable tournaments. Um, based on guarantees which are a lot softer on party poker than rival sites simply because the guarantee is bigger 
like it oh it, it almost every single buying level above like five dollars yeah um also when, also when you track one recreational you also more recreationals too right so like there's just one recreational and loads of break-even players you're attracting more recreational players together you know and also when they play they're playing against like break-even players instead of elite players who will beat them at a higher rate as well yeah. do you know what i mean yep and, and also i think it's it's fun to, for them to the people will get less reads on them too right like imagine if there's a recreational playing in a smaller pr uh, field against like the same 30 or 40 regs they're going to understand like why he's a rec if you're playing in like a thousand runner field or a 500 runner field you play less hands against them so you get less reads on them less notes on them less showdowns against them except yeah you know? um but yeah all right absolutely okay um so i wanted to there was a lot of people that are asking about strategy they wanted to get your take sort of on a bunch of things so i have a general strategy advice question um, that you can hopefully help people with because you are probably one of the most prolific poker coaches in the game. You know, not that necessarily it's out there on YouTube, but like you've taught, how many poker players do you think you've taught? Um, I mean, I used to make videos of poker strategy, which had like 10 million members, get like hundreds of thousands of views. Yeah. So like uh, quite a lot of people have seen the content. Funny story. Funny story, just before we get to it, it's the same concept is that at poker strategy we realized that uh we had we had some guys in our team who were very good with gaming they would play like world of warcraft and all that kind of stuff which i've never killed a goblin or done anything like that but they would tell me that this thing called twitch was really big so when i was at poker strategy they would tell me um let's move our content to twitch uh so they would said i think this must have been 2014 13 ish maybe some, somewhere around there they were like why don't you um why don't instead of, i used to stream like a live coaching session on poker strategy and it would be maybe like 2,000 people would come and ask questions, and it was exactly like Twitch. They were like, why don't we move to Twitch? Our guys will come anyway, then we can attract new new players to like watch us and then join our community. Mm. So I did it the first week, maybe there's like 500 people. The next week, maybe there's 1,000. And I did it for like a few months. I'm not sure exactly how long, but I do like a session every Tuesday and Thursday. And I built up a following higher, higher, higher. And no one would stream Twitch. No one would stream their sessions playing on Twitch. And no one was doing coaching. I was the only one who was in twitch poker but it was just doing live coaching sessions right. you know and it would get it was getting bigger and bigger and we we're like fuck this is like this is this is big and we saw like twitch getting bigger and bigger by the day as well virgin and uh we were like wow maybe we should like push all of our content on here like this should, this is like a huge tool for attracting players from outside of poker and uh i had like a big following and we were getting like all the subs everything was going like huge then we got an email one day saying uh poker is gambling Twitch doesn't support gambling. We can't allow poker to be on Twitch. Your channel's been deleted. And we were like, fuck's sake. <laughs> so anyway, completely forgot about it. And then like six months later, they signed like a, a partnership with that Scott Paul, mm -hmm. I think it was. A, one of these guys who was like head of poker of Twitch or something. And I was like, Jesus, guys, like, could you, could you not have like understood this like six months ago? Because like, I would have probably been in a position to be like the leading guy just because I, I'd already built up the slow following. I was playing like high stakes and stuff. And I was like, I can't grind back through this again from like the start, yeah. you know? So I just didn't, I didn't like go back at it again. And then Twitch, I was following Twitch every day from then. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then seeing yourself and Lex and Jeff and all the guys, I was like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. I can, I was officially the first ever poker Twitcher, which is uh, ahead of your time. I, something I you saw it, man. Maybe. You had yeah. the vision. Well, it wasn't me. That was, there was other people who were the visionaries. I was just doing as I was told. Yeah. Kind of thing. That's cool. Um, Okay, so here's the question I, I wrote. So some general advice, if you could talk to someone that is sort of brand new to poker, it's a three-pronged question. So they're just getting into the game, they're fresh to it, you know, they're not even sure if they're playing tournaments or cash games or whatever, what piece of advice would you give to that person? And then second, let's say you're sort of a serious, um, you know, recreational player and you want to make the transition to being a professional. What is required at that stage in sort of your progression in poker and then last which is uh you're already a professional player but you're sort of doing okay you know like you're making a bit of money but you're not one of the elite players certainly not number one on pocket fives so what's the advice to go that last hurdle and i would sort of include myself in that group so that question is for me sure so as a as a like a true beginner mm -hmm. uh two kind of pieces of advice would be first first i would say join a community on twitch like a raise your edge community where there's loads of people discussing hands and then in that community like really take 
a good look at who the active members are and who kind of makes sense and who you kind of think is similar to you and just ask them to swap a hand history like you're gonna have deep runs even if you're a losing player you'll have deep runs in tournaments it's just the way poker works so say look i had this i, I just won the mini monday whatever uh, here's the hand history. Do you want to look through it? And you send me one of yours and I'll look through it too. And if he sends a hand history back and says, well played, just don't write back to him ever again. Like say thank you, but whatever. But if he's critical and has like 10 hands where he thinks you played absolutely terrible and he would do X, Y, and Z, then this is probably a good person who's going to be honest with you throughout your progression and someone who you can be honest back with as well. And then it can be like a really good way to have a, uh, a kind of poker relationship together because I've seen a lot of people become poker friends and they're just too too nice you know like oh well played good hand history but if you're playing a ten dollar tournament you're going to be making mistakes because that's the level you're at you're a beginner like you said you know so like try to get some honest poker friends from a twitch community like i would recommend raise your edge i think it's really good i'm sure other people have uh communities too i don't know them so well um but i would recommend raise your edge for sure i don't i don't get any money for saying that or i don't get any anything like that so i would i just I, i'm in the community i know it's like pretty good that's all yeah. um so yeah and i would say play a lot and also be focused if you feel like you're going to play don't play for the sake of playing don't play to get volume everything you're doing you should be paying attention so like it's better to play two sessions a week where you're completely focused and paying attention to everything than four sessions where you're tiring yourself out and then on your phone and watching social media and stuff like this because i think a lot of people they play they have a job and they play poker and they get very tired in their job because they play like too many sessions of poker. So like they're finishing too late, not sleeping, getting excited, high adrenaline, and they're doing this like four days a week. And it's just not worth doing. It's better to start just playing one day a week or two day days a week where you're very focused and you're paying attention to showdowns. Because the thing with studying is that all of the studying tools that you're going to use when you're a player, you have to input ranges, right? So like I'm looking at how do I play big blind against button, 20 big blinds when he opens. Like you need to know like how the population are playing and what you see people doing for you to understand what ranges to put in. Because if you just like put in like a random bunch of hands, then you're just going to get a different output to what is actually happening in reality. And then you may start doing things in game and be like, oh, it's fine. The solver said it's fine. But in reality, if, if you put the right information to the solver, the solver may say it's absolutely terrible and you're losing like a full big blind by making the play. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like I've seen, um, I would say like, 80% of people I've coached when we've like looked at ranges they've like set a completely different range to how they how they would range the uh villain compared to how I would range the villain mm. you know so I think um it's very important to have the correct ranges and to get the correct ranges it's all about paying attention making notes taking screenshots like if you see someone run a line and you think it's a very value heavy line then like you know make a note of it like understand like which lines are heavy bluffs which which lines are heavy for value, what kind of sizes people use with different parts of their ranges, different strengths of their ranges, right. etc. So it would basically be, don't try to do too much, like don't play too much volume, play more kind of high quality sessions. And then when you have the deep runs in those sessions, swap them with like an honest uh, study partner, right. I guess. Okay, great. And then- Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, so then what? what's the advice for um, sort of going from recreational to pro? So when you're kind of intermediate, I think like, I mean, spending money on coaching is like ridiculously cheap. Like the investment you put into coaching is just like so sick. Um, I would say like, I know we spoke about it previously, but joining the stable, if you don't have a community around you is good. Um, you have to make sure it's the right stable. Like maybe maybe someone wants to join bitb because they think bitb is the best stable but maybe you're playing like ten dollar tournaments and everyone in bitb is playing eighty dollar tournaments or fifty dollar tournaments or hundred dollar tournaments you know bitb might not be the best place for you then maybe it's better to join like poker with lots of lower stakes guys where you can kind of you know move up the ranks together or, or like share reads on populations together or like discuss ha discuss tournaments because like if you're playing the big 11 and someone else is playing you know 320 gladiator or whatever then first of all they're probably not going to want to spend the time going through 11 dollar hatchery because they're trying to get better themselves too but secondly like the people in their games are playing completely different to the people in the big 11 or whatever 11 dollar gladiator whatever because like because like let's say that they have like jacks and someone free bets them they're like oh we have to get in jacks like he's bluffing this and that and the other but maybe in the 11 dollar game no right yeah you know? so like speaking to people who play the same games as you is very important so 
join like a bigger community with coaches and structured and education paths like to move you on to the next level but make sure it's the right one for you you know like don't try to join bitby if you're going to be playing different games everyone in bitby essentially right now okay. so and then and then the last step how do you how do you go from being pretty good to being elite i think first of all like not everyone can so like a lot of it's down to a lot of it's down to like a lot of, like drive like inner drive that some people just like can't muster up for whatever mm -hmm. reason like i think people are like not necessarily born with with the ability to be like a top professional poker player but they can definitely have the qualities that they've uh, gained throughout their whole life to um to help them get there it's so, like a lot of people just can't do it um like how many people have tried and how many people are there if you look at like uh pocket fives top 10 six years ago i would bet pretty strongly that all 10 players are probably not winning mm -hmm. anymore and the, five, the, the one year before then probably the same and probably now the people who are winning won't be winning in five years either you know like it's tough and i think first of all accepting that it's tough and accepting that it's going to be difficult is important um secondly i would say don't chase don't chase losses don't chase trying to play too high stakes bankroll management i don't really have strong views on bankroll management but i have strong views on not playing tournaments that can determine your week so for example there was a 5k yesterday mm. on party like i created a tournament with rob like the structure everything was perfect for poker players for this tournament like satellites were amazing it got there was a 2k on a rival site which got 60 players yesterday the 5k got 120 players so twice as many runners in the same format for twice the buy-in so amazing mm. tournament but it's, i knew that for me i wanted to have a really good session and enjoy playing a good sunday session but i knew that if i played this 5k and played like three bullets like if i'm going to play a tournament i'm going to play it i knew that my whole session would be determined on how i ran in this tournament yeah. you know so like you know I, i've had a pretty good year like i have like uh different money from different things like i can gamble in this tournament from a bankroll point of view like it's not bankroll management it's more kind of like mental management you know like it's not good for me to play that tournament yesterday because i haven't been playing throughout the week like winning money where then the 5k isn't like a isn't like a huge determined factor of if i'm going to be profitable this week or this month or not right. you know like i don't want to win that tournament over a month and then be a losing player for that month you know i want to have like a very consistent stretch of tournaments around the similar ABI rather than stretching it. Cause I'm playing like the one on nine phase, yeah. right? Like I'm going to play this tournament cause it's an amazing tournament. Like really Great good structure. guarantee, really good. Structure, I love it. Yeah. Really good satellites. People come, coming in from like $1 feeders all the way up. Like this is like a must play tournament for me, you know, like at 215 like masters, this is a must play tournament for me. Like I know this field perfectly. Like I, this is like what I've played for the last seven years, you know, like five thirty dollar buy-ins, like, that's like my bread and butter. Like this is why I know I'm very a 5k tournament. I believe that like I'm profitable in the tournament. I, I know that I'm like my bankroll point of view. It's good to play it. But I think from like a mental point of view and from like a, from like kind of a, I'm not sure the name for it, but like from like a managing my like schedule, it's not smart for me to play that tournament, right. you know? So like, I would love to have played it. It'd be really fun to play it. I think I'd make money playing it. I think I can afford to play it. But for my poker career, it's not good for me to play, you know? And I think that's a sacrifice which I make a lot. I don't play tournament. Like when there's 10Ks and 25Ks on in series, I would have studied before series. I study every day for like two months. Like I'm at tip top of my game. I feel like I've done as much work as anybody from bankroll point of view, I can afford to play them. But I don't play the tournaments during the series because I really love playing 1K tournaments during the series. I love playing 530s every day. I love playing 215s. I don't want my whole series to be determined on how I do in a 10K tournament or a 25K right. tournament, you know, because because then it's just going to make me not love the game as much. And, you know, maybe that's a mental uh, game flaw that I have, like playing this 25K and 10K, maybe I'm leaving a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars or whatever on the on the floor by not taking that ev but i think long term i'll play at higher volume for more years because i won't chase i won't chase basically like i'll never chase something like that i think a lot of people have either gone broke or more importantly they have the money but not the motivation to play anymore which is one of the most common things which, which happen like take fido yeah, for yeah. example right like fido keeps playing 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 and at one point one at one time he then loses the motivation 
saying, okay, like these one thousand dollar tournaments and two thousand dollar tournaments, which at one point he absolutely loved playing, he just can't yeah. play them anymore because he's used to playing million yeah, dollar tournaments, absolutely. you know. So like Fido, he can maybe have like three years or four years of like a really good career playing these chasing, chasing, and chasing. But for me, like I love poker, I can still see myself playing in five, ten, fifty, however many years, you know. And I think the best way for me to do that is to manage my buy-ins. Right. Uh, and I think it's the biggest mistake people have that they, they don't do, essentially. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I I sense that same sort of issue in poker. And, and you know, someone asked me on my Twitch stream the other day about this. I'm curious what your take is. But I think poker, when you look at all other games and sports, let's just combine them. Poker is one of the only ones that's pretty much almost all about money. Like, that's the narrative. That's the narrative in the media. That's the narrative by the poker sites. That's the narrative from the poker players. It's all about money. There's a very small exception to that, which I think is a World Series of Poker bracelet is kind of something that is meaningful that isn't about money. Um, but I've, I've seen so many of my friends go through that same thing, and I've, I've been through stretches like that myself, you know, where, like, when I started Twitch streaming, I was playing $22 tournaments, winning $1,000. I was hyped up. And it's just like, now, mm -hmm. like, that doesn't, change anything for me that doesn't excite me so i needed to develop different goals and different reasons for why i play the game because i think money is fleeting and i don't think it's a big enough story to provide longevity for people's careers and or longevity for this game when it's competing against fortnite when it's competing against other video games that are so much more graphically intense um i think poker needs a better narrative and something more interesting than money I don't have a solution. I just recognize a problem there. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I don't know Fortnite or like Goblin Killers or any <laughs> kind of games. But I'd imagine that if I played tomorrow Fortnite against Ninja, I would have no chance of winning. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I would get one lucky shot or something. I don't know how it works. But I'd imagine like I'm drawn dead against them yep. playing. But if someone plays against, if Ninja plays against me in poker tomorrow. He's gonna win, you know, 20, 30, 40, however many percentage of the time. Like, I think that's the that's the strongest thing in poker is that anyone can compete, yeah. you know. And also, like time wasted and stuff like that, like time spent with mo like money is very important. Like you said, like you can you can achieve and also have the success out of that. And also, like convincing friends and family. If I say, oh, I'm number 100, 100 in the world on Fortnite, I'm not sure. Maybe that does pay a lot of money, but who knows. But if I'm like the thousandth best poker player in the world, I'm making a lot yeah. of money. If I'm the thousandth best FIFA player in the world, I'm not making any money, you know? So like kind of like supporting for family, supporting for friends, like being able to pay bills, like it's money is important. In terms of the $22 tournament thing you said, like the thing is like $22 tournaments and winning $1,000, like you can grow out of that. And then you have 55s next, and then 109s next, 320s, et cetera, you can mm. build up. But the problem with like uh, high rollers is that if I play a 5k, there's only one a week, yep. you know? Or if I play a 25k, there's once every three or four months. So you don't get to grind the variance out and work hard to be able to get that yes. out, you know? But if you like stop, get, if you stop enjoying $22 tournaments, it's okay because you can always move up to 55s or you can always move up to the next level, which then excites you, you know? Because 5k's do excite me more than 1k's, that's for sure. But I just, there's not enough games of them to play for me to have like a a like realistic career by playing, them, you know, without it being determined on a level. Yeah. Or variants, etc. And I don't I don't want to like have a bad year or two years and be like, fuck, like I can't win back this, you know, four hundred K, five hundred K by playing these five hundred dollar tournaments. I'm gonna have to play, you know, six days a week, which right now is not what I want to yeah. do. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well I think it's interesting you see the biggest bosses of the game usually play one or two days a week online if they haven't already graduated to just playing fifty and hundred Ks, you know? <laughs> but you Well, I, I would actually say like the biggest bosses I mean, I, that's that's a, that's another thing. Like, people view the biggest bosses. Like, if you say who's the biggest bosses in the world, most people will say players who are actually like losing players, or like players who are like not making that much mm -hmm. money, or players who are like not making that much money for themselves. Like, maybe they're playing high rollers with a low percentage of themselves. Like, there's very few like bosses, bosses of the game who are making like lo lots of money and playing a lot. I think like the true bosses of the game are people like Lena and C. Right? Yeah, and grinders guys. that are day and day out. They've been playing high stakes for four or five years. They show up. They start almost every game. They're in from the start. They play long sessions. They play every single day during the series. They don't take a single day off during the series. They know every regular. They know every tendency. Anyone shows up new, they send them back down to the stake below. They're very, very tough to play. 
they don't play theoretical like they don't study peer solver and all this stuff i don't think they play their own brand of poker they're very confident in their own brand of poker you know that i'm i think they they win because they understand people and i think moving forward they will continue to understand yep. people and i think these are the guys who are like the true true bosses or the cash game guys who play every day like yeah. linus and these guys who also play a lot i think volume is actually very important because again how can you be good at poker and know what to put into the, there's guys who play one day a week and they study six days a week i just don't understand how they're doing it because how do they know what to put into the solver if they only play one day a week you know like for me it's quite good because i i spend a lot of time coaching and going over hand histories so i get to see what people are doing and then i can kind of interpret that information and put it into the solver and study with it but if someone plays one day a week especially on a sunday where you have so many tables and it's hard to like pick up all the information i think i think a lot of it's just bullshit like i don't think they're actually I don't think they're actually doing it. I, I think a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I'm studying a lot, and they're not actually studying. They're just like playing FIFA or like Fortnite or whatever. <laughs> I, would, I would always be very, very suspicious of someone who says, oh, I'm not playing so much, I'm studying. Yep. You know, like through what I've seen in, in, in my last 10 years, I think it's 80% of the time bullshit, right. you know? And uh, a lot of the guys who are chasing the kind of live success and story and all that kind of stuff, very, very difficult to study effectively out of a hotel room when you're not playing high volume and to understand all the information and then to because let's say you pick up there's like a um let's think of a strategy thing so not going too deeply but like for example something that people don't do which is theoretic because let's say i open from um middle position and you free bet me from the button for let's say 80 big blends deep and i call generally your range is going to have all ace king offsuit ace queen offsuit that you're like maybe free bet like kind of merge with you're also going to have some like ace jack ace 10 offsuit a lot of basically combinations of like offsuit high card mm -hmm. hands whereas my range is more kind of like pocket pair heavy like you're not going to have like pocket fours five six or sevens eights nines you're not going to have as much like seven eight suited you're not going to have as much like queen jack suited that kind of stuff right you're going to have mostly like offsuit high card hands when the board comes down something like uh eight three two like a low board this is actually very good for me because I have all pairs. I have very little hands, which I like completely whiff here. If I do have like a high card hand, I usually have like a backdoor flush draw. Whereas you have just a lot of nothing. You have a lot of ace, right. nothing, ace, jack, nothing, king, queen, nothing, ace, king, nothing. So actually in theory, out of position is supposed to lead here a lot. So I'm supposed to like bet a lot here, like a small size in or even half pot. And it's very difficult for you to proceed because like, are you really going to call ace 10 and then like turns get dicey, you know? And so basically when you like realize a theoretical thing like that it's then good to like then go and play a and then you're not going to get into that many situations a session maybe two or three a session in this kind of a situation so you need to play maybe like five days a week to get like 20 30 hands of what happens to see how population react so how population generally react is that they will raise their strong hands like aces kings and queens and they won't they won't bluff raise much because like king doesn't want to bluff and then like they will fold a lot as well essentially so if you only play one day a week it may take you like two months to work out what's how people are reacting right. whereas if someone's like lena let's say he did this he could work it out in like you know a week or whatever you know so then he's like then got that spot solved then he can move on to the next spot. yes Do you know what i mean so like playing ball playing studying is one thing but like like the exploitative way always makes you more money than the theoretical like gto versus gto way so putting the volume in and understanding how the theory works and how you get from it is extremely important because that's where you're going to make the money from playing because like playing this kind of defensive gto strategy especially in tournaments this is not how you're going to make money absolutely yeah i mean most people people ask me all the time in my twitch stream like are you a feeler you're a math player and that's like a very common like live poker question like oh, i'm a feel player or, or an online guys are the math players. But really to me, I think both is obviously important for being a good poker player in, in, in any aspect. And what people reference as a field player is understanding the population. So it's, it's like being mm -hmm. able to project and make assumptions about your opponents in how they're gonna react in certain places. And you get that by experience, by playing and actually seeing it, and then sort of like extrapolating that to human psychology. And then the math is what you do when you know those tendencies. It's like, okay, if I do this, yeah. like, well, here's the optimal thing to do given this sort of player profile. So poker is, is, uh, is both feel and math. And like what you're hitting on there, like that, that's the unquantified skill set in poker, that, that feel part of poker where really you're just understanding humans better than, than your opponents. Um, 
yeah and the best players in the world are the ones who can come who can exploit they understand the theory then they know how to deal with it because like you have to know the theory to be a field player like you you can't like let's say that someone should see that like 30 percent or 50 percent or whatever like you need to see you need to see where people are like making incorrect things for you to then exploit yeah. and then make the the adjustment on it you know like if you know someone should use like a 70 percent size in on like 942 button versus big blind that they use a 30 percent size in then you can start like understanding how to get to the next level and like exploiting them but if you haven't done the theory work you're probably just gonna think okay yeah it's just a standard yeah. size and whatever you know, you know what they're doing but you don't and know how I to think... take advantage of it exactly yeah. exactly and if you think of someone like negranu or helmuth like these kind of guys actually like they're very good at like exploiting people do you know like they're very good at like understanding the mistakes people make and then kind of like doing the thing to to punish them like i think in almost every game the top winners are always the guys who are playing like um yeah yeah absolutely absolutely all right well thanks for that answer let me see here if there's anything we've touched on a lot we've talked about a lot here um okay I have three more things. One, party poker. Um, when did you start with party poker? How did that all come about? And sort of what is your what is your role? What do you work with party poker on now? Um, so, like I said earlier, uh, I had this initial conversation with Rob when party literally, you know, hardly anyone playing on the site. And we started to make slow changes. So at the time, the best tournaments on PokerStars were the 22 cubed. I'm not sure if you oh, yeah. remember this tournament. Yep. And the eleven dollar rebuy, and at the time, stars were like raking rebuys and killing rebuys. So, so we saw like a gap to kind of add rebuys on the party, but people didn't really take them too much. But they did okay. It 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 brought us a little bit of traffic. Then we start adding more and more stuff that people wanted. And um, I've always acted in like kind of like a cons a consultation role. Like I'm not the guy that that is going to like travel around. I stop every week wearing the patch grinding these live tournaments like i think i can add more value in different ways i i, I like i said my job was being a poker ecologist like i did this professionally like for poke stars and for all the sites like i was hired by almost every site with a team to like give this kind of feedback so like being a pro with like an image as well as being able to understand what's going on and being able to like take feedback and give the right feedback to the team i think is um is kind of unique in a way like it's um it's tough to have like the combination of both of the things and also to enjoy it like i kind of like i enjoy someone writing to me something which is incorrect and me having a conversation and explaining why they're incorrect about the thing and for them to have a better understanding of the poker ecology so if someone writes to me on twitter and says this is bullshit why are you doing this this is wrong then i can reach out to them and be like no it's right because of x y and z and that for them to understand and then to agree and then in the future to have like a better understanding of the poker ecology to be more sympathetic about future changes but also to sometimes disagree and to educate me as well like i have conversations about poker ecology all not all day every day but every day for like hours for sure whether it be with rob whether it be with high stakes players whether it be with people i stake whether it be with like internal people from party poker like i'm thinking about poker ecology like all day every day at least in some way so if, I'm also educating and learning myself, like what's right, what's wrong. Like we've made loads of mistakes with Party Poker. Like we've changed things about, like I think the biggest strength about Party is that they're so dynamic with the changes. So as soon as something stops working, we don't allow the tournament to just die and die and die for months and months and years and years and keep some prestige name or some bullshit like that. If it's dead, we, we, we kill it and we move on to the next thing. We try something else, else which can work, you know? So I think the only way you can have a perfect schedule is if you keep tearing down the things which don't work and adding the things which right. work you know and then um so yeah i like working with the team doing that i don't necessarily like you know going to play a hundred dollar tournament and somewhere and wearing a patch and you know like doing that kind of stuff it's just not my thing and they understand that and they they respect that too and they don't ask me to ever do anything like that at the same time you know i'm playing high stakes on the site uh, I play I play fast forward on the side. I'm playing like fast 500 fast forward very often. I'm playing high stakes tournaments on the side very often. I'm playing you know World Series and big tournaments like I go to Rio, play millions, all that kind of stuff. I will play that stuff and you know uh, I just don't do the whole kind of like sponsored pro right. stuff. I don't want them to give me buy-ins and then to play for buy-ins and get to give them profit. Thing, you yeah. know, like 
that's not that's not what I want to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the structure of being a sponsored pro used to be so specific, you know, no matter what site you were, it was like a very standard deal of like, you get this, you get this, you know, or whatever. But it really doesn't have to be that way like that. You know, it was a system. But I think there's so much room for there to be openness and sort of collaboration with with uh, poker players and, and poker sites. So I think it's refreshing that you can have, you know, sort of a sponsorship and consultation role with them. And they let you just be mm -hmm. as opposed to like, we need you to stream. We need you to do this. We need you to go to this event, like like be able to create your own mm -hmm. your own role and provide value in your own way. That's really cool. Um, and it's it's also similar to poker strategy. I like that I can do little bits of little, like the VIP team. I help with small things thing or the product team like when a new software comes out i'll always test it first and do like the better mode and then give feedback stuff like that i like that they keep me involved in everything and then i can i can understand and relate things back to people because whenever anything goes down on party it's me and rob get tagged into a tweet like what the fuck are you doing you know so like it's good to know what's coming up so then i can then react and like explain to people too you mm -hmm. know because like anything negative which happens i'll get blamed for it which is fine i will also get praise when things go well so i have to accept the criticism as well for sure like the software going down it, like i think around about a year ago the software was very unstable there was all these ddos account uh, attacks on all mm -hmm. the sites and it's very frustrating for someone like rob or someone for myself where people are beating like tell your tell your uh tell your company to spend more money on software or on, on ddos or something like this and you know like all the sites are going through the same thing it's a very difficult thing to stop mm. you know and it's like you shouldn't spend money on a pro you should spend it on software it's not really how it works you know they they spend like millions and millions of you know, it's not like all the money just gets pushed into a few high stakes pros who are playing giving them buy-ins yeah, or something like yeah. that it's not like yeah that and a lot of people think it's like one or the other like all the money has to be put into one direction and it's it can get a little frustrating at times but also i understand why people would think think like yeah that too. so that leads into to uh my second to last question here which is i think you're in a very unique position where there's very few people in your spot where you have a lot of experience in the industry on the operator side as opposed to as as well as being an elite level player so you sort of operated at the highest levels on on both sides so I wanted to ask you if there's anything that sort of stands out um, either from a player perspective or an operator perspective that you think is a bit of a miss in the industry. Something that if you had the power to just like change people's thinking or change decisions that you would you would alter. Um, sure. I mean, I think the, the most clear thing is bounty builders are bounty builders. They're strictly they're structurally incorrect. So you have vanilla tournaments and then you have bounty yep. builders. So in every single casino in Europe, I guess in Canada, in America, wherever, there's live poker tournaments going on like all the time, like $30 tournaments, $50 tournaments, $100 tournaments, whatever. Like I know if I went back to my hometown, Newcastle, there'd be like four casinos with four different tournaments going on tonight, you know, on every single day. If I go to London, I'm sure there's like five different clubs. If I go to Manchester, there's probably another five clubs. There's a lot of people who enjoy playing these vanilla tournaments. And these people are generally people who like to get value for their money they go for the experience they go to the casino instead of going to the cinema you know they spend their 20 pounds on an experience and they want a good structure and all that kind of thing, right so that's fine with bounty builders it's completely different crowd so the bounty builders and bounty hunters and whatever else you want to call them this is a kind of new generation of players that we can attract via twitch maybe they're casino players or whatever else and these are the kind of guys who want to gamble right? like they want to go for bounties they want to gamble they want things to be fast and furious, you know? So this is, this is this is definitely why there's more of these people than there are of the casino people, but there are still the casino people and they need to be respected. But these bounty builder uh, crowd, they want things to be fast and furious for sure, because that's why they play bounty builders instead of playing these vanilla tournaments, which is fine. However, the industry has this standard bounty builder structure as nine max tournaments. Nine max tournaments generally come from casinos because casinos don't have enough space and enough dealers. So you need to fit as many people around the table as possible whilst keeping enough cards for the flop turn and river, you know? So nine handed is basically the most you can casino, you know, maybe 10, but that's the only reason why they have like, right? So we do nine handed in these bounty builders or hunters or whatever. And they're like 250 big blinds deep which is very counterintuitive against the structure. Like bounty builders, you want to be able to get a bounty from like hand one. That should be the whole point essentially because you're playing them to get the bounty, you know? Um, so I think the 250 big blind deep, nine handed bounty hunter builder, whatever structure, I think it's completely bullshit. And 
bounty builders, hunters, whatever else, they could have been hugely more successful than they already are successful. You know, like they're very big right now. And this is with an incorrect structure, I think. Once they have a correct structure, which I think should probably be six handed, should probably be 50 big blinds or 100 big blinds starting stack, um, I think is way better. Also, with with re-entry and late reg and stuff like this, it's very incorrect as well because they, they late reg it down to like 10 big blinds, 12 big blinds, 15 big blinds. But for a bounty, you can't register with 10 big blinds and be profitable because everyone else is going to have you covered. You can't gamble for stacks. You can't even get half the prize pool. A lot of the prize pool has already been eliminated. You can't even, it's not even there to take, right. you know, like even if you get lucky, it's, it's disappeared. People have cashed it out already in the last three or four hours. So what I think should happen is probably unlimited re-entry and with a shorter late reg period and a shorter start and stack. So something like, um, something like 80 big blind start and stack with one hour late reg and unlimited re-entry this would promote gambling but it wouldn't allow people to like make minus cv entry uh register into tournaments and it would allow it would kind of we've seen on like other sites like even in 25ks on on gg and stuff like this amateur players like to fire like 10 bullets like they, they don't want to be told you can only have one bullet or two mm. bullets so i think allowing people if they want to go all in every hand to chase bounties because that's why they're playing in tournament allow them to do it you know but don't try to milk them and let them go down to like 10 big blinds or 15 big blinds where they're just simply like losing so much money that way, you know so i think if someone wants to gamble a lot they shouldn't play nine-handed because they're going to get crucified because everyone else's tight ranges and strong hands is going to kill them. So I think six-handed, uh, 80 big blinds deep, unlimited re-entry with a shorter late reg is the perfect format. And bounty builders, hunters, whatever, they could be 100% bigger than what they already currently are, right. I think. That's interesting. I never thought about a lot of those points. That's really... Uh, that's All right, cool. I like it, man. The reason why they aren't for the counter argument is because people or sides want people to play as many tournaments as possible to rake as much money as possible mm. you know so like if it's nine-handed i can play 10 different tables if it's 250 big blends deep you know i'll i will run aces into kings a few times or kings into aces whatever then i'll like re-enter like more and more times you know so it's like it gets max re-entry from people and max multi-tabling from people but for me that's a very short-sighted way to approach the ecology you know we should be thinking what is the most fun format which is going to attract the most amount of people to make people come back more often you know um so yeah i'd also say guarantees on vanilla tournaments like you know i think they've been i think people have basically said our oh, bounty builders are good so let's kill vanilla tournaments you know first of all the rake on vanilla tournaments are actually more than bounty builders, at least body poker. That's the way it should be. So like vanilla tournaments should be in the in the site's best interest to actually run. Um, but secondly, a lot of recreational players, there's no recreational player who plays in casinos four times a week for the last 20 years. You know, like the typical guy who loves playing yeah. these tournaments. They've not played bounty builders before, you know. And a lot of like older people who have played poker for like 20 years, whatever. Like they like pure yeah, poker, yeah. you know, like vanilla poker. Like, I know if I went back to my local casino, I know for a fact all of these guys would love vanilla poker and they they wouldn't really get the whole bounty stuff. Like yeah. they've tried bounty tournaments then they just they'd don't call work. It bingo. You know, not... They'd ask like how many chips do you start with with no regard for structure? Exactly. Like the same questions every time, dude. Like exactly. they want to be able to sit and play so poker people, not, and fold. They don't, get, they don't get they don't get big guarantees though. Like they the sites don't gamble with the guarantees. Like if you take the two fifteen tournament which run which has been running like nightly on like rival sites to poly poker it gets like 10k guarantee and it never really gets pushed because things which get pushed are like bounty tournaments you know because there's more people see oh the people love bounties so let's push bounties and let's fuck off the vanillas but party added last week uh 215 50k masters so this is five times bigger than like the rival tournament and instantly hit 60k hit 70k hit 80k you know the demand is out there you just need to put the guarantee on it. You know, like that people are attracted by guarantees. They don't want to play a 50 runner guarantee, three X entry against the same people all the time that they think are probably cheating together or whatever. You know? They want to play against lots of different people with a bigger guarantee where they feel like with a good structure, a good structure to these guys is important. So basically what you need to, what I think needs to happen is to really understand the bounty, the bounty players and the vanilla players don't put them together because they're completely different kinds of people you know it's like it's like trying to have the same marketing things to sell like a sports car and to sell like a, a family car or something you know like you're attracting like the one one kind of target person you're trying to attract is like the young 
the young the young male potentially and the other one is like a family wife or husband right. you know so like it's like you'd have like different marketing strategies towards the two people they want different things right and i think with vanillas and bounties it the industry doesn't really understand them and they've kind of they've, they're making bounty builders nine-handed 200 blends deep because they see that this is what kind of happens the, the vanilla people want these but the bounty don't want them. yeah you know what i mean it's absolutely like, yeah need to understand need to understand both both of them uh separately and this is what i've tried to push with party like the Galactic six max now and if you've if you've seen the guarantee of the Galactic, it's like absolutely every day it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger you also get more re-entry because people bust more often therefore the, the prize pool goes up more as well because you're getting more re-entry in an earlier phase um because you collide more like big blind versus small blind big blind versus button cut off versus button etc there's so many more spots to gamble there's so many more spots to get bounties to chase bounties there's more like let's say someone goes all in and then someone else goes all in it's easier to gamble in six max because there's less people to act after you so you can call the third all in more often with like a suited connect or whatever because there's less chance someone wakes up with like a really strong hand right line, yeah whatever else yeah absolutely uh, so yeah these these gladiators i think uh i hope that they're going to show the industry that this is how the, how it should be um for for bounties but, but yeah. let's see let's, let's see how it goes that's really cool all right last last thing man and uh it's a controversial one some people don't want to talk about it at all anymore they're done i'm kind of done with it too but i'd be remiss if i didn't bring up the mike postal situation just a quick take we're not going to get into this because i'm sure we could talk for two hours about it like everyone in the whole poker industry has done for weeks what's your take mm -hmm. on mike postal because i saw some tweets and i just want to hear from you so i think first of all like it's very difficult wait it's very difficult subject um there's like a lot of different points first of all i would say 95 percent chance he's cheating to like 99 percent. very very yeah. overwhelming cheating. i think the way that we've the industry's approached it isn't the best um i think a lot of the evidence which has been displayed has been very clickbaity and it's been driven in a way to get like views and likes of evidence which is very weak and if anything the evidence could be support impossible rather than the other way um i think for anyone who's let's say i was like um let's say i had like a poker news site i think i it's very good for me for possible thing to drag on and for him to be guilty or for people to think he's guilty because it gets me more likes it gets me more clicks it gets me more yeah. views it brings et everyone et together like 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 it, everyone's unified you know there's all these clicks in poker and people that like this side or don't like this side but pretty much everyone's on the same page on this so it it's good for views the, the problem is a lot of people are on the same page but it becomes like a witch hunt and a bandwagon i think as well like let's say possible played a hand and he had like uh he had like aces versus kings and just called down mm -hmm. whatever and was whatever he had aces like a standard yeah. cooler i think if someone like doug polk tweeted possible wow like he's, he's cheating blah blah like whatever i think that it would get like at least 100 likes and like at least five yeah. retweets you know like people just don't watch stuff and they just retweet and like which is a big problem and also a lot of people aren't educated and jump on the bandwagon like there's hands which are just like really not at all at all dodgy like they're completely standard if anything like i said they support him and if someone who has a credibility or if someone is a high stakes player whatever tweets it if you're a micro stakes player of course like let's say um i'll think of someone who's not involved like let's take someone like andrew robel right if andrew robel tweeted out a video of like a mike postle thing which isn't bad at all but he posted it and it was like calling down uh like correctly for example of course every amateur player who watches is going to think the same thing that he's cheating they would trust Andrew him Robles yeah there's just, trust there yeah. for sure the per whoever posts the content has a lot of responsibility i agree you know? they have a lot of responsibility on their hands like if i started posting possible things and people that, like i have like a decent understanding of poker i have a lot of responsibility to post these hands if i post a hand it needs to be very very it can't even be borderline yep. you know it can't be borderline because if it's borderline it promotes a witch hunt it promotes a bandwagon it promotes bullying to some degree and i think postles very likely scum whatever guilty i don't care but i fear for the next people who are innocent because there's going to there's going to be someone who comes along and they're going to be innocent and it's going to be one or two hands which are borderline which look bad 
and someone's going to post them and everyone's like wow another scandal and it's going to be great for poker media because they get like 10 videos and all streams all this kind of stuff and then they're going to find all these like borderline hands which aren't bad but people will jump on them and then an innocent person is going to be like they're going to be yeah, fucked. Yeah. and this actually and the reason why i think about this is because it's happened to me previously uh, i was on at the time when party poker was really surging up the ranks there was uh, I was playing EPT Barcelona and I was on the feature table and there's a lot of weird stuff going on like with a patch I wasn't allowed to wear this and there was a lot of weird stuff going on there's a lot of rivalry at the time and uh, we were on the bubble of it we were on the bubble of the EPT Barcelona I think yeah EPT Barcelona and uh I played this hand where I 3x pot the turn or 2x pot the turn, like a huge, you know when you're on the bubble and you do like a huge bluff to try to make someone just fold their entire mm. range, like put huge pressure on. I put this huge pressure on this guy and he called the turn. Then on the river, I checked, he went all in and it was a bubble. So you know in the bubble of these EBTs or like millions, whatever, they go on, like each hand takes yeah. like 10 minutes. So he went all in and I was like, I had, not, I had four high, like literally nothing. And I was like, um, I started like talking to him and trying to get a read on him and try to get like, because the feature table is very boring to watch, you know, because like when it's just like 10 minutes in between hands, people are just sitting there watching. So I tried to talk a little bit and to like give some banter. And like I went to fold my hand and before I like threw my hands over the line, he like went to throw his hand in quick. They tried to like make me, make me like reconsider almost because like, as he was like really happy to right, call his yeah. hand, you know, I like took my hand back and I was like, oh, you're weak. Like maybe I call you now thing. But like I had four high or whatever, like the whole table was like joking around. So anyway, I folded my hand just, and I was like, oh, I had four high. I folded my hand and then the commentators at the time, like, wow, angle shoot, blah, blah, blah. And like, I didn't know what was going on. And I got a text message from my dad saying, uh, son, is it true what everyone's saying? And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, everyone on Twitter is tagging you saying that you're like cheating. And I was like, what? I was like, what? what? I, I didn't even right, know which yeah, hand they were talking yeah. about. Because in my mind, I had four high. So straight away, I found out what happened. And I said to Stars or whoever was doing the prediction, I was like, can you guys just like show the hand back and show that I had four high? So there's no doubt that I was like angle shooting because I, I can't call with four high or whatever. So anyway, it went on and Negreanu that, that day made a blog. He was in Barcelona. He made like a vlog sorry, like a video about this angle shoot and he was tweeting a lot about it. And then Doug Polk made a video or like tweeted something or something saying it was an mm. angle shoot. So I made like a vlog in response, basically just like saying exactly why I didn't cheat. And then I think Doug, Doug had um, made a comment on the video, something like, yeah, but if you're innocent, you would have an X. And it had like a hundred likes or something, or like maybe 20, like it had yeah. likes, what, however many. It was. So I messaged Doug and I was like, I said why it wasn't X in the video. Like, like if you go to minute 14, I say exactly this thing. And Doug was like, oh, I, I couldn't watch like a 15 minute video. Like, I'm busy with <laughs> So I was like, come on, that's so weak, bro. That's a weak response, but keep going. Yep. But no, but like fair enough to Doug, like he'd watched it and in his, his view, his reason why I was guilty was this. And he didn't want to watch me speaking for 20 minutes. It was, dry, it was not a big thing, mm. you know, but it just showed me that if someone posts something, a lot of people will like it or cling on to it or whatever. And then like on two plus two, there was a thread. And like, even now, like it comes up on like a weekly basis. Someone will talk about the pad, pads angle shoot, you know? And like, I know a million percent and like still, they, they will still have the archives. I would bet all the money in my world that I have four high and I was never going to call, yeah, yeah. you know? And I would just like them to come out and show it. So, it would, so conclusively, I can never be called a cheat or something, you know? But I've just seen how like, an industry, how like our industry is toxic. But I think every industry is like this, and I've seen how bad people can jump on things and how they turn and how they can be a bandwagon. And also, I've seen about how bad it feels because I felt so bad. You know, like my mom, my dad reading this stuff. It's mm. not nice. You know, like my friends, like people probably who don't even people have probably seen like if they type Patrick Blender poker, maybe like the sixth thing which comes up is cheat or something. You know, or like angle shoot or something like this. You know, and like obviously it's very far away from how the industry. Me, I think, but if I was going for a job in the future and someone like really searched Patrick Leonard Poker, they will see that I angle shot or something, you know, which like it can hurt people's credibility. And you may not even think by doing like a like or a tweet that you're hurting somebody, but like if they're not proven guilty, it's very dangerous to jump on a bandwagon. Yeah. So the next person who's innocent who gets caught up in a scandal for whole cards or cheating or something. I feel very sorry for them because I feel like the industry is going to. Luckily for me, this happened three years ago where people weren't really going too far on social media yeah, yeah. and stuff. If this happened now, you know, you can lose sponsorships, you can lose stables, you can 
you can lose all yeah, sorts it's a, of stuff. Yeah, it's a huge drama bomb, man. It's huge. And and I you know, I think I think so I I think it's extremely, extremely likely Apostle is guilty. I think in, incredibly mm-hmm. but I think it's true that it's it's a witch hunt and if he wasn't guilty he'd be, be treating you know treating sort of the same way if the few influential people sort of hopped on it and and i think an example is like um you know in one of doug's videos he sort of called out the commentators for potentially being in on something like the way that they were responding he thought was very weird and suspicious and then all of a sudden a huge throng of people sort of started a witch hunt attacking the commentators it's just like okay so we have this Mike Postel evidence of all of these incredible hands, like statistically very, very bizarre, incredibly likely. And the case against commentators is basically like a hazy, like, uh, it feels weird. These are very different situations. So to use your platform mm-hmm. to cast blame on the commentators when there isn't anything clear there and throw this throng at those people that are very likely innocent at the end of the day, as opposed to a Mike Postel, that's the difference to me where that's that's wrong. I agree. I think it also hurts the, like, the legal case too, right? Like imagine like the legal team who are working against Postel, mm. right? Like they're going to take him forward for 30 million. I'm not sure how they, like let's say he won 200K in these sessions. He probably cheated like, I don't know, 100Ks worth, 100, 200Ks worth, 30 million is a lot, but whatever, that's a different story mm. for a different day. But surely this team now is hurt by all of this evidence coming out, you know, like because the defense is going to be like very well prepared, right? Like let's say, the, let's say a commentator's in on it he's going to have a lot more time to to prepare defense than if the police come knocking one day saying we think you're guilty of X, Y, and Z, you know, like you can't delete things off your phone or text messages or whatever else, you yeah. know, so like I'm not, too, I'm not too sure it's even beneficial for the people involved. I, I think the only thing it's beneficial for is the media mm. people, you know, like I don't think it's beneficial for the people who have been hurt. Maybe it is, I'm not sure. I think the initial kind of the initial thing is like, okay, there's, there's a problem here. Let's address the problem. But pulling up every single piece of uh, investigation, I, I don't know. Maybe it is really good. You know? It's entertainment. You, it's entertainment. It's for fun. You know, like like I was following all the, the news about it because it's just like drama. It's poker drama. It's yeah. Celebrity poker drama. Crazy. Everyone's got to take. Everyone's got a different personality. Like it's a reality show. You know, it's not the news anymore. But that's like the school. That's like a school play yard kind of thing too, though, right? Like people bully and jump on things in school, and uh, when someone is suspected of doing something, right? And then like yeah. it's 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 good for the play, it's good for the playground to accuse someone of something to get entertainment for yourself, you know. And it's good for you. It's good for everyone else to have fun out of it. But it's not good for them, you know. And if they are innocent, if they're guilty, then sure, fuck yeah. them, you know. But if they're guilty, you should kind of trust that eventually they'll get found out and trust in trust in the legal stuff and trust in just like karma, trust in whatever else. But if they're innocent, and I'm not saying Postle is innocent, like I said, 95%, 99% he's guilty. If someone's innocent, then I think, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's fucked. There's you responsibility know? there, 100%, you know, and it's taken very lightly, I think, by some in this industry. So I, I agree with you, man. And... I do take one issue with one thing you said, which I think you said every industry is toxic. And I've talked about this a little bit. I think poker is a particularly harsh industry, I think, because I've I've participated in bubbles outside of poker. You know, like I wanted to be a professional golfer growing up, wanted to be Tiger Woods. Unfortunately, didn't work out, but like that was my passion. And in golf, golf is incredibly not toxic. It is very much based around history and tradition and being a gentleman and like there's a lot of respect for people that have accomplished things in the game. You know, like everyone has an, a tremendous amount of respect for Jack Nicholas, for example. Whereas like Daniel Nuranu has got shit on on Twitter every single day for the last like six years. You know, like that. Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods got shit on, shit on him. No, when he went down through like a bad. Period. Yeah, but oh. there was there was more leeway given by the golf community than there would be by any other. In that there's still a level okay. of respect, even though he lay, he led a life that wouldn't typically be be led by a lot in the conservative golf industry, right? So so it's it's a very different thing, you know. And then academia is my only other career, and it was just like not at all like poker, where it is just very toxic. I think poker is more like games in that way, where it's uh, kind of fleeting and maybe lacks some of the maturity of some of these other games. So, I mean, I guess like office environments, right? Like almost every office environment has lots yes. of politics has lots of fraudulent stuff going on so like 95 percent of people who work like in normal i guess they would experience like very similar stuff you know like you know like once you're disgruntled unhappy it goes on and on and on it's easy to like one person in the team you feel like gets preferential treatment and everyone else in the team kind of 
games up against mm. them or like has a vendetta against them or something like this so i think like most people will experience this to some degree you know and it's very good being it's very fun being in a group of bullies or the group of people who are like teaming up on this guy who you think has had unfair judgment but maybe he just worked hard and maybe he did this or that that you don't that you just don't see for whatever reason yeah. you know and he's the one he's the one guy who um he's the one guy who who, who gets yeah bad, I guess. for sure man um, golf golf i guess is a, a gentleman's game yeah so. it's, it's, it's been around a while it's been it's different if you go to my wikipedia now i mean sort of an example of like your your you know slow roll controversy or where where people thought you were sort of angling you're angling controversy if mm -hmm. you go to my wikipedia it says one of my notables is that i'm known for selling my tournaments at extremely high markup like that's one of the notorieties oh, yeah. of my my poker career because <laughs> like there was a controversy <laughs> five years ago when i first started streaming um where I would like put up action in the marketplace on two plus two, which I've been doing for five years. You know, I'd sell 1.1 mm -hmm. to 1.2. I'd sell like the million and you know, the 55 and stuff. And like, like, was I winning in those games? Like, eh, like probably not as break even or whatever, but you know, there's so many people that are interested in buying, and especially with streaming. There was a ton of people that are interested in buying and they didn't really care what price I sold at. You know, I could have told them 20 bucks and they would have been like, yeah, okay. Um, you know, it, they just wanted a, a sweat. So there's a huge controversy like, and like, like crowdfunding. Sorry? It's like crowdfunding. It's like crowdfunding. Yeah, exactly. People, people believe in that and they want to sweat the idea. Yeah. I mean, people donate to my Twitch stream every day, $10 for nothing. They get no piece, right? They just give me $10. Like, exactly. thanks for the show. So like instead certain people wanted a piece and like they weren't really price sensitive. That's hard to understand if you're sort of not a streamer, or a poker media person, like you don't see any value in that like especially coming from where we come from and like we're looking for ROI in each tournament and it's shameful to play in a tournament where you don't have a positive ROI or like not something you really you you aspire to do right but what I struggle to see is why where people get the energy to focus on if like first of all to like rate your game to be a mm. level to care where you're selling to follow it all that kind of stuff like why do people care like what's what what's the what's the reasoning behind it usually it comes from securities you know mm. it comes from the fact that they can't sell action or it comes from the fact they can't play these tournaments or can't afford the tournaments it, it it's very rare that like a high stakes player who plays these tournaments or a guy who is staked or whatever will come and be the guy who spends the energy on no yeah for stuff, sure you know like i i think it's like a level of it's not fair you know i feel like there's there's like an injustice where it's just like injustice to, yeah. it isn't fair that he is getting to sell these tournaments at 1.2 and i can't sell them and i'm better than him so therefore i you know yeah. i think that's kind of it but you know so there's a big controversy and to this day there's like people in my youtube comments that are just like oh he wouldn't be able to get by if he didn't sell action at like one one point five. you know like five years later i'll throw up like 10 percent on crazy. state kings here and there that, but... that, that blows my mind like really yeah, blows man. my mind like i just I, I just can't imagine and it also like if, if you are that person like it's a huge deal that you're like this you know like it's a huge huge deal like if this is like you're never going to succeed in life if this is how you if this is like your approach to yeah. like how you're doing on things it's like such a dangerous such a dangerous way to be yeah man i mean it's it's tough like like dropping dropping hateful youtube comments you know i can't think of any sort of successful people that i know that ever partake in those in those uh sort of activities it's just it's weird you know but we all gotta start somewhere so you know maybe maybe they're on their road to improvement but i think i, ha I think i have this liked the video before not yeah of course ones. i think i have liked the video before i'm not sure why maybe i just i don't know maybe i haven't liked the guy who made the video or something but still even that feels like quite well funny. i mean you you threw one out at rob young uh, this is full circle now back to the first story of the podcast here exactly i mean you, exactly, you threw yeah, it out there exactly that exactly and it all came from my own time i was like um rob wasn't giving me the attention where i wanted a journalist i was this up-and-coming player who thought i was better than everyone else when it, when in fact i was playing like two dollar tournaments or whatever and it all came from my ego that this commentator was playing epts and wpts where i was better but I, I thought i was better than poker than him so i had to go to the keyboard and be the yeah, warrior yeah. you know like I, it all came from my own ego and my own it, my own problem it's like if someone is giving you some negativity it's almost a compliment it's like you're the place where they want to be you know that's like a pretty that's a pretty strong for, for someone to for you to be in the place where someone else wants to be there's not much bigger compliments you can find yeah. than that i think it's like 
pretty powerful. If, if when you're like 10 years old, you're like, when you get to 30, there's going to be a thousand people who want to be in the place you want to mm-hmm. be. That's like, that's like pretty sick, you know, like it's almost like life goals, you know, because a lot of people, hardly anyone who wants to be where in, in their shoes, you know. Yeah, so. absolutely. So it's funny. It's funny how that works in the in the poker world. If someone out there could please update my Wikipedia. I mean, you can leave that footnote, but like maybe maybe add another notable or something. You can add that I do the weekly poker showdown, uh, you know, sponsored by Party Poker once a week. Just throw that out there. Um, Patrick, we, we've talked on end. This is going to be the longest ever episode uh, of this podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time today um, and chatting. I feel like I've learned a lot and, and uh, a ton of useful stuff in here. So thank you, man. Big thanks again to Patrick Leonard for taking the time and talking with us for an hour and 40 minutes. I mean, incredible conversation. I really loved it. I think I learned some things I'm going to take away and really think about. I mean, it's it's a real honor that I get to talk with so many successful people of the game with this podcast. I'm having a great time. Hopefully, you guys are enjoying it as well. We have one more thing to cover this week before we wrap up the show, and that is, of course, Poker Hero of the Week. So we're going to give you away a $320 Gladiator ticket. Now, we need to start with who our hero of the week was this week that we were railing along. So, uh, Procesha89 finished 193rd place in the Gladiator, which was unfortunately out of the money. Um, the last place paid was 144th, so he was about 50 away. He did, however, manage $158 in bounties, so congratulations on that. Thanks for representing and getting some of that money back from that $320 ticket that you won. So the winner this week, and the question was, how many big game entrants are going to be, be this week? Because it was back on $5,000 buy-in. The actual amount was $119. Uh, the closest guess was $118 by Profession NLH. So congratulations to you. Please send a direct message to Party Poker or like a tweet to them uh, and say, hey, I'm the winner. You're going to be into the $320 Gladiator for this Sunday. You are our Poker Hero of the Week, so please represent the show strong and get the victory, my friend. Actually, second place. I'm playing. So, I mean, first or second, it's fine. It's up to you. (laughs) This week's competition, um, we're actually going to take inspiration from my fiance. The holidays are here. It's Halloween, and pumpkin season has arrived. So for a $320 Gladiator ticket this week, you're going to have to compete on your pumpkin carving skills. Let's put up a tweet here somewhere. My fiance made a pumpkin about this show. The intro to this show has a very flattering photo of my face with a beard that I'll never actually be able to grow. She carved it into a pumpkin. Now in a tragic accident, that pumpkin is no longer with us. It is broken (laughs) and destroyed. But uh, we have an empty pumpkin here and I would love to see your guys' skills as to what you can do. Now you don't have to um, carve the logo of the show. I just want to see your poker related pumpkin carving skills. So use the hashtag, uh, JS pumpkin. Okay. JS pumpkin and tweet out your photos of your pumpkin carving skills. The winner is going to win a $320 gladiator ticket and be our representative in the gladiator next week. That's going to be it for today, everyone. Thank you so much for checking out the show. If you have any feedback about segments you liked or you didn't like, still want to hear from you. This is, you know, we're about five or six episodes in, but still learning a lot about what you guys like uh, watching and and listening to. So please pass that along. And a big thanks for taking time out of your week and uh, supporting the show. It means a lot. That's going to be it from me. Thanks so much for listening slash watching. But until next week, we'll see you later.